TGT has hopped on. I'm going to go ahead and add him. Oh, man. Would you go ahead and mute the, the other one? I'm here. I'm talk? here. You're in the building. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I, this is an honor. Absolutely. But it's just like an honor to meet you. And <laughs> I'm so I, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. No I problem. I've been on your home for the whole time before you like view it and then at the end you know how you usually do it you talk and then yeah Absolutely. i think so first off for those of you who don't know why did i call this book the black box this book is called the black box because in an airplane there's something called a black box and it's an indestructible box so when the plane crashes engineers will retrieve the black box from the airplane and black boxes do not burn in fires if the plane is submerged 2000 feet in the ocean the black box stays intact Thank you for paying your tuition, Maximo. I truly appreciate that. Mr. Rodriguez says, Sassin gang, what's good? Uh, thank you for the game, paying my tuition. Thank you. Um, so as I was saying, the black box in an airplane is indestructible. And what it does is it records everything that's going on in an airplane so that if an airplane crashes, engineers can retrieve the data from the black box, play the audio from the cockpit, the audio from inside the plane, look through all the data from the plane's mechanical and the, in, in the engine to see what went wrong, why did this airplane crash? But what people don't realize is that a black box not only records when a plane crashes and why it crashed, but it also records all of the successful flights, all of the times the airplane has soared above turbulence. So I call this the black box because it's pretty much all of the permanent memories of my life of times that I've crashed and burned and times that I've soared above turbulence. And what the premise of this book is that we all have a black box that we can reach inside of to pull out strength, to pull out memories of when we've been successful, when we've been strong, when we've been like intelligent. We can also pull out lessons of when we fucked it up. And we can say, whoa, yeah, I remember this memory. I better never do that again. So that is why this book is called The Black Box. I also thought it was super clever to write black in black so that it's like empty here. Um, so I thought that was pretty clever. This is how we differentiate the original 100 copies of the book from the ones you ordered on Amazon. So if you have a signed copy from me, it'll look like this. It won't look like the one on Amazon. This is my copy, which I took everywhere with me. This is a, a pre-production copy. So um, American Original writes, bro, here in Colombia, I hear you, my G, you got the swag. I learned every time I listen to a video, you lit, son. Hey, I appreciate that. And if you're in Colombia and South America, bruh, I am going to make it down there. I'm thinking I'll probably end up going to uh, Medellin. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably end up in Medellin because I hear good things about Medellin. So I will be there. Expect me to pull up. Uh, within the next six months. So shout out to all the, the Colombian cats. Jay Scott writes, Pusher Man, which is the name of one of the chapters, what you got to lose, make them tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. That's one of the quotations from that chapter. And Pusher Man is a term way back in the day that the old cats, they used to call drug dealers pusher man, the Pusher Man. And when I was a kid, like 10, 11 years old, that's when I got into the tr uh, drug trade. And the way I learned how to be a great drug dealer was before that, my mom used to have me go door to door selling candy. And she would always tell me when I would walk up to a house and there would be a little sign that said no soliciting, she would say, don't worry about that. Go knock on the door. What do you have to lose? Make them tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. So that's one of the lessons that we have in the black box, which is too often we tell ourselves no. If you want to go meet a girl, don't look at her like, oh, she's probably going to shut me down. Hell nah, make her shut you down. She might tell you yes. Make that girl shut you down. If you want to sell a product, go try to sell it. Make them tell you no, but never tell yourself no. You should be your number one supporter. You heard me. Peyton writes, bought the book and ready for the conference. Peyton, I'm looking forward to having you at the conference, brother. Adrian Mora writes, this showed me that I had to be sharp and willing to lead myself. The chapter is called Peace. Ooh. Yeah, man. Um, I really want to echo that, that particular sentiment that I shared in that chapter. Leading yourself is so important, especially as a male, 
Because, yeah, you could take advice from anybody, from your mother, from your father, from your best friend. Yeah, you could take advice. But imagine if you take someone else's advice and you fail or you take someone else's advice and you have a bad outcome. Because there's nothing worse than getting a bad outcome based on what somebody else said. If you mess up, you'll feel much better if you messed up because of your own decision. So it's always better to go with your gut and be your own leader because the only person who truly knows what's in your heart is you. As a man, you have to get comfortable listening to your gut. That's a really important thing. So always know that you are the leader of yourself, if nothing else. And you need to groom your leadership skills because eventually you will be the leader of a family. Eventually, you will be the leader of a company, I hope. So always focus on your leadership and being a leader means you have a strong enough stomach to make tough decisions and you're okay making a mistake. Most people don't want to take lead because they don't want to make a mistake. You have to be comfortable knowing your decisions won't always be right, but that's okay. And a lot of people on the internet truly hate women. And if you listen to my content, it's not woman hating content. I love women. And I promote that you guys all love women and find a woman that's worth loving, whether it's a friend or otherwise, because most of the good things I have in life came from women. Not only my mother, I'm talking about women who are friends, women I've been involved with, find you a good woman in my acknowledgement. I don't acknowledge any men. I acknowledge four women because when I put this book together, it was a woman who told me to write the book. Professor Beverly Tate said, Marquette, you have a unique story. You are the only person I know who was a bona fide criminal and transitioned successfully from being a criminal to going into corporate life and being successful and thriving as an international businessman on three continents. That's a unique story. And I didn't really listen to her when she first said it, but I eventually got around to writing the book. So that's why she's listed there. Bridget, you guys know Bridget helps with so much of my life. I couldn't have accomplished what I've accomplished today without her. And then I have two other individuals listed who have helped me write this book by reading over it and editing it and doing all of these things. And guess how much money they charged me? Zero dollars. Hugely important. My first chapter. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take you through the chapter titles real quick. Uh, first one is You OK, Mama. It's basically introducing my family background. And what I really want to communicate to the reader when I'm building this up is that no matter how great someone may seem today, everyone's had struggle. Whether you're a Jewish white person and you're very well to do, yes, they have struggles too. When it rains, it rains on everyone. Sometimes we think that we're in a uniquely bad position. I've even seen gentlemen in my comments write, Marquette, give me some game for short men. Hey, guess what? The game for short men is the same game for tall men. It's not that much easier as you may think. Yes, people babble about, oh yeah, a guy needs to be at least six feet. But that's not the case, man. The truth is everyone has challenges. I saw a guy write on one of my YouTube videos. He said, Marquette, you know, like, why don't you give some game for people who are not like you? You're tall and handsome. Things are easier for you. No, nah, nah, not quite. I've literally met women who say you're too good for me. I met women who said you're, you're better looking than I am. I don't want to date you. You're going to cheat on me. Right. No one has a perfect situation. It's not like you're always looking at the other person thinking the grass is greener, not realizing the abundance that you have. So that first chapter is building out my family structure and letting you know what I really came from. The second chapter is called Swing First. And that title is absolutely important in that a single punch can start a fight and end a fight. So your question is, what side of the punch do you want to be on? Do you want to be on the receiving side or the side that's serving the punch? And what I'm telling you in that chapter is that, hey, man, you got to be the aggressor in all things. You always got to be the one going hard. So swing first is me growing up in a ghetto, learning that, hey, you can be the predator or you can be the prey. You can eat or you can be eaten and letting you guys know that, hey, whether you're in a ghetto or not, life is a war. If your ass ain't ready for war, you're going to suffer. So I'm starting people early and letting them know like how I got my war mentality, hoping that you can read that chapter and get your war mentality. Odin's TV writes, keep up the wonderful work, brother. I appreciate the knowledge that you are sharing and I hope you continue to grow and see success forever. 
That's love. ODTV, that's love. And I love when the saints pull up on me and they share good tidings, they share blessings, they share goodness, and they speak light into my life. And that's what I encourage you all to do. You will be of tremendous value if you always have a kind word to share with someone. You will be of tremendous value. People will love to be around you and to see you when you can always bring light and lightness to any situation, whether it's heavy or not. So I appreciate that, Saint. Carrying on. It says, can you send the link? I'll buy the book right now. I'm just going to pop the link in. Uh, you can get the book. There's only 29 of these copies left, which are the copies that I will sign for you. And so I just wanted to let everyone know um, you can get those at assassin.com slash the black box. Um, carrying on. And I'm trying to watch the comments and, and give you this game at the same time. Um, so do forgive me, uh, saints. But I first want to take you through the, the table of contents. The third chapter is called Where Your Mama At, which is essentially, you know, a chapter about the reality that sometimes the people who are supposed to be there for you are not there for you, whether it's your family, your spouse, your wife, your baby mama, whoever the case is, your mentor. It's teaching you that, hey, it's lovely if they are there, but you have to realize that in life's war, sometimes you are a soldier, an army of one, and you're the only person who can fight on your behalf, which is why I love boxing because it's not a team sport. As soon as that ding, ding goes, no one else can fight for you. It's just you. It's a great metaphor for life. And I know I did a, a video on Coach Pink Pill because he had this whole video talking about men are tired. Well, it turns out that you need to fortify yourself as a human being, as a man especially, and realize that, hey, life promises challenge and struggle. So you have to be up to the task every day, which is why it's so important to make your body, mind, and spirit strong. Life is easier when you expect it to be challenging. And the reason that I come on here to speak to you guys is because I want to tell you the things that my father never told me. I want to tell you the things that my mother never told me. My mother never told me how hard adult life was. My mother never told me how hard it is to find a job you love. My mother never told me about financial freedom. I didn't even know that was a concept. I only observe struggle. And that's why I come on here to show you abundance, to show you what freedom looks like, to give you indications of the specific steps you can do to get you to where you want to be. And it all starts inside of your mind. It starts with mentality and thinking. Because even a fit physical body does not exist until you made a decision to work out. Everything starts inside of your head. It starts with the intangible things called ideas. Andrew writes, what are your thoughts on female strategy? I came upon it. I came upon on it and I was reading that women become emotionally detached to keep men. Thoughts on this? I think there are a variety of things that different types of women do. You really have to look specifically at the woman and the situation. You cannot apply this blanketly. When you're talking about women, this is an art, not a science. So I will briefly say that some women are emotionally detached because they're not interested. If they're not interested in you, they're going to be emotionally detached. That's not a strategy. That's just the way they really feel. Other women can try to portray emotional detachment to get you to pursue them more so that they can feel wanted and valued, so that they can increase your interest in them by creating absence. Yes, that's true. I suggest you avoid a woman like that if you're looking for a long-term relationship because that woman is playing a game. When they're running strategy, they're playing a game. If you want a long-term relationship with a woman, it should be a relationship in which you don't have to think a ton. You don't have to constantly strategize. You don't feel like you're on the opposite chessboard as the woman. That's what you have to look for. If you just want a layer and player, well, in that case, yeah, go ahead and deal with any of these women, but make sure that you keep your thinking cap on and you engage those chess moves. And never move faster than you want to move. If she's texting you three times a day and you only want to text one time, stick to the script. That makes you comfortable. Andrew, I hope that helps you. Thank you for the super chat saying. Domo writes, will the audiobook be available anytime soon? Also, do you think audiobooks are retained mentally as well as reading physical books? Good question, Jomo. The audio book will be coming out within two months of today. Um, that's because I actually have to record it. I'm recording it in my voice because only I was there for every scene. And I know how these people sound. And in this book, a lot of these words are verbatim. 
So if I'm describing a ghetto girl, I know exactly how shorty sounded. If it's a it's a, a super hood blood from LA, I know exactly what a blood from LA sounds like when he's like, hey, blood, I'm just bicking back, being boo, boking on the bing, bing, blood. You know, I know what they sound like, so I have to make sure that the voice is portrayed in the correct way. So that's gonna take about two months from today. So I appreciate you asking about the audio book. Now, in terms of retention, is audio retained as well as the written word? I think generally speaking, it depends on your mode of learning. Me, if I hear something, I can remember it nearly verbatim. That's how my brain is. But your brain may be different. One thing I can guarantee you, though, is when you take notes in a book, when you write down, when you underline, when you reread, it'll help you retain. Let me give everyone a tip. Pay attention. It's the three R's. Read, write, recite. I'm aware that write starts with a W, but it's known as the three R's. Read, write, recite. Read the book. Underline the important parts. That's the read part. Read, write, recite. Write out the notes from what you underlined. Recite. Read through your notes and say it out loud. And then repeat that process three times. Reread everything. Rehighlight everything. Rewrite down the notes. And then re-recite everything that you've read. You will retain it beautifully. The truth is nothing comes easy. If I can get up and give you a speech or recite a poem from memory, it didn't come easy. It was an accident. It's hard work behind the scenes. Amateurs often look at professionals and think, oh, they got talent. They got a special mind. No, they don't have a special mind. They got a special grind. They know how to grind and work hard and hustle. Huh? Got you. So Adrian Mora writes, can you go over how you started a fraternity at University of California, Berkeley? I would like to create one. Um, I'm assuming you read about that in the black box. Uh, I pretty much described most of it in the black box. So I would advise you to read back through that chapter. But generally speaking, whether you're talking about a business or fraternity, you don't create things because you want to create something. You create something because there's a need in the market. If you want to create a fraternity, but no one else wants a fraternity, no one's going to join. If you want to create an app for creating study groups, a mobile application, but no one wants that app, no one's going to download it. So you always do things because there's a market need. I created a fraternity because there was a need for a fraternity for people who wanted to come together in brotherhood because Berkeley was 25,000 undergraduates. You just feel like a nobody when you show up. And also I didn't drink. So I wanted a fraternity for guys who really wanted to build bonds, have a good time, have memories, share memories, have fun, meet girls, but we're not alcoholics. And there was a need for that because all the other fraternities were circled around alcohol. So there was a market need. So number one, I advise you to look for that market need. Cool. Invisible ink. I had to read what wasn't there. Ahmed Khan, I, I just recently talked to on a consultation, um, very accomplished gentleman. And I like his point about invisible ink. I had to read what wasn't there. What you guys need to tune your mind to is knowing that if you're intelligent, you have a tremendous advantage. You should be constantly applying your intelligence. The sad reality is that it's not about how intelligent you are. It's about how often you are intelligent. There are a lot of people who are smart, but they don't use their brain enough. When I brought on a female guest onto my show, I don't even want to call it a show. When I, I brought a female guest onto my live session, because this is not entertainment. This is education. This is not a show. When I brought on a female guest who's very accomplished, uh, some of the men wrote, well, you can't take a woman's advice. Well, if that's true, let's assume it is true. What you should be doing is trying to study how she's speaking and what she's saying. And what that should indicate to you is that, well, let me read between the lines of what she's saying. Or if you're intelligent and you know I'm intelligent, you know I brought her on for a purpose. So put her on her, under a microscope and figure out what you can see. There's always something there to see. Even a homeless person can teach you something about wealth. Their only lesson might not be how to get wealth. It might be how to squander wealth. And so you've learned not what to do, but what not to do. Everyone has a lesson if a wise man is the one looking. So thank you for, for sharing that meaningful note. Carrying on. Just trying to look through these comments real quick. 
This won't be too much a spoiler on the book, is it? Haven't gotten the book yet, uh, being BS, and I have a whole $25 Amazon gift card sitting here. I think that should probably cover the book for you. No, I don't think it'll be much of a spoiler at all because a lot of the stories are very detail oriented and I'm not going into the stories. I'm just going into some of the short morals from the book. And it has 34 reviews on Amazon. Looks like it's all five star reviews. So it really is a good work that was written with practical steps. And the goal for me was to make something to where you can read it. And at the end of the chapter, it says, hey, if your ass didn't figure it out, this is what you need to learn to improve your life today. Carrying on. Just want to make sure we can acknowledge the, the super chats in here. Dante Harrison writes, I'm thinking about getting your book for my 14-year-old son. Dante, that's exactly the demographic that I wrote it for is young men. And what you'll find is that the book goes from age zero all the way up to age 26. And what I'm trying to help young men do is to build a strong foundation for being successful. I talk about my experiences in middle school and high school and struggling to make the right decisions. And so I truly believe that a young man is going to benefit the most because he can easily put himself in the shoes of me going through these experiences, which he's inevitably going to go through. Kevin J. Daniel, going to go ahead and merge you in. Talk to me, Saint. Hey, man, what's up? How are you doing? I'm chilling. I'm feeling good. How about you? Man, I just started reading the book. Uh, I'm doing good, man. Uh, there's good. a quote right here I really like. Um, it's, uh, he who worries before it is necessary suffers more than necessary. Mm, absolutely. And I also have like a, a question concerning um, that part. Okay. It's basically, when is it uh, necessary to worry? Never. It's never necessary because okay, okay. worrying doesn't solve a problem, right? Exactly. Worrying doesn't solve the problem. And in fact, what you'll find that when most people are worried, if you can maintain your presence of mind, they will always look at you as the leader. When you're in a big room and everyone starts to panic, if you're the one that's calm, people will look at you and say, oh, that must be the leader. Because it's always the leader who says, okay, everyone calm down. Let's chart a course. Let's figure out what the challenge is. Let's identify the outcome that we want. Let's identify some steps and let's get to work. Leaders are optimistic. Even though I'm not a fan of President Trump, when he came into office, he said, let's make America great again. That's a positive big thing. When you ask someone, what's Trump's slogan? Make America great again. What's Biden's slogan? Nobody knows. He doesn't have one. Yeah. So leaders, one of the, the toolkits from a leader is, number one, you don't worry. You stay positive and you chart a course. You have a big, exciting plan. That makes people want to follow you. So okay. even though you might not like someone, it's always good to learn from them. So that's a good modern day example of how to not worry because Trump came into a bit of a rough economy and coronavirus is pretty rough as well. But to hear Trump tell it, everything's all right. Everything's going to be fine. Um, and that's really the messaging that human beings generally want to hear. So the leader is always the, the calm one, basically. Calm, optimistic, and he's the planner. He can deliver the good. So not only are you calm, when you're calm, you say, this is what we're going to do. And that's yeah. the part that's meaningful is that you actually have some action steps. You're not yeah. going to say, okay, let's just pray. You say, hey, you know, there's a real problem. We can address it. This is what we're going to do. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. I really appreciate you uh, tuning me in, man. Thank you. Oh, man, it, it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm really here to hear what you guys gather from the work and how it affected you because to me, it's a living document. If, if I need to take a chapter, chapter out because it's not valuable, I'm going to take it out because I want it to be very crisp so that someone can pick it up and you can say, hey, man, you need to read chapter 15 and then go straight to that chapter, read it, and it can give them something to help them in whatever situation they're going through. Because even for your audience, I'm from a very background than you are. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in Canada, first of all. Okay. So uh, I'm in Montreal, Canada. And uh, like I didn't grow up uh, the same way as you did, but there's always life experience. No matter who you are, as you said, you can relate to this stuff. Right. And that's that's the crazy part is that 
we tend to think that, okay, this guy had two parents. He was middle class. He, his parents were as a doctor and a lawyer. He didn't have any problems. Right. Not, not true. Every human being has problems. Everyone's going to experience loss of loved ones, ill health, poverty. I know a girl who, a Jewish girl in San Francisco, she grew up very wealthy. And then when she was 20 years old, her father, who was an investment banker, lost all of his money. And now they have a whole different life. And so like no one is immune to experiencing challenges. And whether you're poor or wealthy, you have to still make yourself strong to deal with it because the challenges will come. Got you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, how are those ladies in Montreal? Because the Canadian women I meet are very friendly, lovely people. Yeah. Yeah, they're very, very fine. Well, now we're all, we're all confined. So with like nothing is really open here. Like all the businesses are, uh, they're not shut down, but most of the people are working from, uh, from their home and uh, the gyms are closed too. So I'm working out at home. So. Man, that's, that's a, that's a tough life. That's a tough yeah. life yeah. for you guys, man. We got you guys in jail up there. Yeah, it's cold, but the ladies are hot. Yes, yes. That's a beautiful thing. JB Dreaming writes, peace, quiet, dropping in and paying tuition. What's the most poignant lesson from your early 20s? Wow. That's a good question. So he wants to know the most important lesson from my early 20s. I'm going to try. You haven't finished the book yet, right, Kevin? No, I'm on page. I just received it like two days ago. I'm on page 35 right now. Uh, oh. no, 51, sorry. Okay, cool. I'm going to make sure I don't give anything up right now. So I'm just going to go to page 42, it should be 232, because that's around when I'm in my 20s. And I'm going to just kind of skim through and see if there's any quick lesson I could share with the saint from my early 20s. Um, <laughs> that's funny. And you know, the, the thing that I found surprising in life is that you think you learned a lesson and then you keep making the same mistake. What you're going to read in my book repeatedly is do not deal with low class women, right? Women who they, they're not wealthy. They don't have status. They don't have anything to lose. Because if you deal with a woman who has nothing to lose, if you make her mad, she will do anything to hurt you, right? Like she'll send out your dick pics. She'll send out photos of you naked. She'll call your job and say something crazy. She'll accuse you of things you didn't do. Anything. Yeah. And, and sometimes if you're, you're a successful man, you might be at a nice restaurant and there's a gorgeous waitress and then you, you meet her and then you get involved with her. But really, you shouldn't do that. And so my most important lesson from my early 20s, which is a time where I was dealing with a ton of women, is... Be selective on the women you deal with. Only pursue high level women. You can pick what woman you want. Why not pick the woman that's on your level? Educated, wealthy, ambitious. Yeah. So if things go wrong, she's not going to be like, oh, I'm going to send out our sex tape because she will be embarrassed herself because she has integrity. She has her own values. So that's my biggest piece of advice to young men in their early 20s, because you're building a name for yourself. You're building a career and your name and your reputation is very important. You have to guard it. You have, have you had any experience with that? Uh, not too much. I'm, I'm really, well, yeah, kind of, but I'm really selective anyways. You know, like my, my parents have been uh, together for almost 30 years. So I know, I already kind of know, you know, uh, what it is to have a high value woman, you know, like I see my mom, my, my mother as a high value woman, my dad, you know, he, he's a strict guy. He's a, he's, you know, he's Sri Lankan. So he, he doesn't fool around, you know? <laughs> right. Right. He's a real man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And Kevin, that's a beautiful thing. I'm glad you shared that with us because a lot of the society, we forget that there are these beautiful marriages that go on for 30 years. The woman plays yeah. her part. The man plays her part. They have kids. They have a beautiful family. That's how life is supposed to work out, right? Exactly. For me, it, it only took one experience for me to 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 learn that because mm -hmm. I had already knew what it looked, what the other side of it looked like. Meaning, I knew what a good uh, and healthy relationship uh, looked like. Of course, we all have our ups and downs, but I knew what unhealthy uh, was and. I saw what unhealthy one was once, 
And I, I, I just learned from that. Right. You got up out of there, right? I, hey, I appreciate you tuning in, Kevin. Thank you for sharing your your insights and kind of one of the passages that meant something to you. And do let me know what you think of the book. I'm looking forward to your feedback. Sure, Thanks. man. Thank you. Thank you for letting me in. Absolutely. Just R. Hello. How you feel? Good, Pretty good. How about yourself, sir? I'm well. Thank you for asking. Good. Excellent. Well, Very nice not. to see you, man. Um, I Likewise. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I would like to ask a question about the book, but I would like to disclose that uh, unfortunately, I haven't had, haven't exercised the opportunity to acquire it yet. And the reason why I say mm-hmm. opportunity is because I've already am assuming that it's going to elevate my life and and enhance my growth in mm-hmm. you know being able to learn from your perspective in the written sure. form. And so, in that regard, I actually wanted to ask a question in regards to how do you feel like um, you've been able to convey your message and your experiences and your insight in the form of writing that maybe you can't do as effectively in verbal and video forms of content. Mm -hmm. Is there anything writing's been able to do for you in uh, continually uh, promulgating your ideas? Meaningful question. There are two major pieces. Um, I believe in the foreword of Mein Kampf, which is the autobiography of Adam Hitler. He says that the written word will never do as much as the spoken word, never. And this is true. And he was able to essentially hypnotize an entire nation of highly educated people through the spoken word. So undoubtedly, you cannot be as emotional, as persuasive as the spoken word. However, the written word is for the true seekers of knowledge. True seekers of knowledge come to the book, the written word. People want to be entertained. They go to the video. They go to the audio book. They go to the, the verbalization. So I know that the true seekers of knowledge will acquire the book. They will read the book, they will reread the book, they'll yes. reference the book, and it will really sink in. And also the book is timeless. And more importantly, when you go into a university, they don't assign you to watch the video, they assign you a text. And I wanted this to be a text that will be used to influence the minds of men for time immemorial. And so that's why I wanted to immortalize the story in the book and the lesson. So that's what I was seeking to do. And I think that it's really done a great service. And I'll tell you what's really impacted me. When I look on the reviews on Amazon, I see that the reviews are written by young men, the exact kind of men I was writing the book for. And that means a lot to me that they read it because I could tell some of them are not readers, but they chose to read this book. So it's really, it's been warming to me. And also, you can never reach the the level that I need to reach without a book, right? Absolutely. I can never compare myself to, say, like a Muhammad or a Jesus or, or a Mao or a, a Muammar Gaddafi. But all of these figures have a book. Muammar Gaddafi has the green book. Uh, Muhammad has the Quran. Jesus has the Bible. Mm-hmm. Everyone must have a book. And what history teaches you is that there must be a book. And so uh, this is kind of my testament. And what I wanted to do better than all of these other books I wanted it to be very simple, like so simple and easy to understand. And what's more, I wanted it so that you don't have to read it straight through. Like if you know a kid that's having issues, like considering joining a gang, you can say, hey man, go to chapter uh, 11, which is on gang. And he can read chapter 11 and that story means something without him having to read anything before chapter 11 or anything after. Whereas conversely, in the other books, you kind of have to read them in a linear way. Yeah, definitely. No, I love that, man. I love uh, <clears throat> just some of the the reason that you have in <clears throat> choosing to continue to express yourself in these various forms. One, I'm sure many people appreciate the video content, but also being able to digest the ideas and written, I think is very powerful. And the word you use, immortalize, oh, I think that's mm-hmm. powerful. Just like, because it's true. I mean, it truly is going to be, you know, tangibly, continually uh, transcending you know, many generations. And I know it's going to have a profound impact on those we come across in this time, but I'm sure many after. So um, kudos to you. I definitely, I want to give your book the the due respect to really be able to digest it um, attentively. And so that's why I've been kind of been patient with the acquiring process. I'm like, you know what? The time is going to be right. And I'm going to sit down with my guy on the verbal note. And we're going to have a conversation. You're not even going to know it. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be digesting the words and I look forward to it. To, you know, hearing how it impacts you because... 
the only reason I, I wrote it is for someone to pick it up in a hard time and say, damn, this, this brought me out of the dungeon. Or pick it up in a good time and say, this made me hustle harder. Yeah, um, yeah. That's that's all we wanted to do. And let's see, we got Dominic Perez writes, thank you, professor. Quick question, lifestyle business or empire? Considering Cali taxes and business restrictions. Okay, do you have any thoughts on that one, Jeff? <clears throat> lifestyle business or empire? Considering Cali taxes and business restrictions. Well, I definitely say that um, trying to build any major enterprise in California is going to have some challenges in regards to that. As you see, many corporations are trying to relocate out of Cali and um, there, some are saying there's somewhat of an exodus out of California, you know, and people are going to Texas and other places considering not only some of the tax um, regulations, and but also I think it's important for us to consider how each state deals with various circumstances. So if, let's say, theoretically, there's another pandemic, what state do you want to be stuck in if you're limited in your business practice and right. the different things that you're able to do as a human being? So I think it's beyond business. It's about lifestyle, which kind of goes into his question as far as lifestyle business considerations. If you're not able to work with clients and such as a result of future occurrences, that's going to be inhibiting and very frustrating, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. so I think what's important about the lifestyle business is understanding that, um, one, it really is important. It's driven by your personal being, your personal brand, right? When you're creating an empire, you can create a commercial entity that's separate from you, a separate name, separate entity, different service. You can have other people rendering a service to where people don't even know you're the face. Think of how many companies we have no idea who the CEO is, who the <laughs> owner is, who the CMO is, CFO, let alone. There's all these different people that keep major corporations and commercial businesses alive. But when you're, it's a lifestyle business, it's all you. So not only are you dealing with the pressure of being the constant representative. It's only mm -hmm. you. You can't you can't sub your name for someone else unless you figure out a way to brand it like that. It's all on you. But then also that, you know, can people deal with the attention of that? Can you deal with the constantly have to promote yourself even when you're not feeling it? When you go through those dark slumps of I'm feeling depressed, I don't know what's going on this now, whatever. You still got to be that guy if your <clears throat> full income and revenue is based on your presence. So I think it's advantageous to have commercial business concepts that you can distance yourself from and not always have to be the face. But at the same time, if you feel like you have a voice and something that you want to say and offer that only can come from you, then I think personalizing that can be beneficial. But I start with the commercial business practice or your empire, for say, and then work your way to lifestyle if it's something that intertwines and really works for, you know, what you envision yourself doing. Boom. Great. <laughs> Josh, that was a great answer. Side I mean, note, you wonder what I would look like if I had hair. This is how I would look like if I had hair, right here. If I had hair, I look just like this man. This uh, this so, uh, Dominic, to answer your question, I agree with everything that was said. Uh, and those are some considerations I wouldn't have even spoken to. It is so important to consider what state you're in because I'm in Nevada, right next to California, and life is radically different. Much better, I would say. Yeah. And with regards to a lifestyle business, I interpret that question as a business organized around you living the life that you want, being free, you know, having control of your schedule, not working extremely hard, not managing a bunch of employees. Lifestyle business is a business that makes it easier for you to thrive doing the activities that are most fun to you. So I, at this stage, always promote a lifestyle business because I figured out that happiness is the key to everything. Happiness is the key to having high energy. Happiness is the key to not having to sleep a lot. Happiness is the key to attracting women. Happiness is the key to living a long, healthy life. Happiness is the key to being fit and feeling loose and young. So Absolutely. always go for happiness. Yeah. Building an empire, eh, I've had a lot of employees. I'd rather have very few employees. Because bigger the company, the more responsibility, the more your time it takes. Absolutely. And as Jeff said, when you do organize a strong business or corporation, you want to minimize your role as the leader as much as possible so you can go out and do the things you really enjoy. Because at the end of the day, a business is a data-driven organization, and you got to dig into that data every day, find new ways to increase sales, new ways to market, new ways to beat your competitors. It's a vicious sport, and you might not want to be engaged in that constantly. So I would choose a lifestyle sport, uh, a lifestyle business. Secondly, considering Cali taxes, 
California is the worst place for politics, the worst place for taxes. Uh, I highly recommend against it. You always want to organize your corporation in the state of Delaware. That's most favorable. Nevada also is not a bad place to organize a corporation, but it's atypical. If you want to build an empire, you use a Delaware C corporation. That is the way the big boys do it. Um, and there's a lot of things I can elaborate on, on where to hide your profits and how to protect your assets. <laughs> to get started, I say pick that lifestyle business, go for the happiness. I like that. Yeah, I think we had a couple more that we missed. And you got some game, Just You got some real game, Bredrin. I appreciate that, man. That's what I'm saying. I, that's why I, I vibe with, you know what I'm saying, what you're wrong. Because I definitely, you know, I, I, man, picked up a lot from yourself as well. Hey, absolutely, man. Life attracts like OTA. Thank you for the super chat, right? Have you heard of photo reading? And if so, what do you think about it? OTA, again, we've reached an area of my ignorance. I've never heard of photo reading. Like, like, I, I, photo can't reading. What I, think about, I I never heard of that. You're talking about reading stuff, never having you know, I think yeah, I don't know. I think the only thing I think of is photogenic memories and that definitely is not your boy. I can't see something once and then uh, got it locked in for the rest right. of the time. So, yeah, I'm going to have to speak. <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with photo reading, so you'll have to forgive me for, for my ignorance um, on that one. But, uh, Jess, was there anything else you wanted to share with the people? I think we got through the super chats. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Definitely. Um, I would like to do one more follow-up question at that. You know, if Absolutely. I don't want to be respectful of your time as well. Yeah, um, so, I... First, I would like to ask, to my understanding, the black box is currently available in English. Do you have any other uh, additional languages that you have it translated in? Or as of right now, it's just English? That is a great question. The funny thing is that though it's only in English, uh, we've sold books in Germany. We've sold books in Mexico. We've sold books uh, in obvious in Australia and UK. We've sold books in Albania. <laughs> we've sold books in... Uh, Italy, we sold books in the Dominican Republic, all around the world, all sorts of markets. So um, I really want to do a reprint with a few modifications before we translate it into different languages. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I don't want to get it first because that's impossible, but I want to make sure that it's pristine before we translate it. Absolutely. Um, I'm excited about that. So yeah, it, it shall be translated. Definitely. No, I and I, I, I can imagine it once again, I just continue to move, you know, further in uh, additional languages. But I ask also, too, because I want to ask this kind of theoretical question. If, let's say, you were to translate into that secondary language that wasn't English, but let's say, just for the sake of this question, also not Spanish. It would be another language outside of English or Spanish, because obviously Spanish is kind of the most prominent outside of English, especially in America. Um, right. If you were trying to attract a particular foreign cultural audience, very strategically, like you wanted, you know, a lot of cats in Germany or a lot of cats in Albania to really know that the black box exists and be able to digest in their language, what language would you translate it into for, you know, cultural reasons? Because you want to really appeal to that particular audience. Good question. So firstly, and I know this is not directly addressing your question to start with, and we'll get there, but... I always think as a businessman, so uh, you always want to make your next move your best move. So firstly, it's an American book. It's going to sell best in America, which is the largest consumer market in the world. Not largest in America, but largest by purchasing power. So first, the United States. Then we're going to go to the UK because those are like our little, it's like our little brother. Then we go to Australia because it's a very large English-speaking market. Yes. Then from there, if you say, I'm going to translate this into a different language, the question is which language first? You always got to go for Spanish. Because in terms of the, the cultural alignment between um, Spanish-speaking countries and the United States is very high because they're in our sphere of influence. So I go to Spanish as the second one. That's the easiest one in terms of marketing. And then if you think about, well, what's the third language? Well, the third language I would go for is Mandarin because mm -hmm. it is the most widely spoken language uh, because China is such a big country. Uh, so I would definitely go for Mandarin because that is going thing is a powerful force moving forward because China will be the new hegemon in the world. That will be the control. What America is today, China will be tomorrow. So we'll have really? to go into Mandarin. And the Chinese people are actually not super religious. They've always been more oriented on philosophy. And this is a book of philosophy. So Confucianism. Um, Taoism, all of these philosophies of the Orient, they became very as popular in the East as religion has been in the West. Wow. So I think that it would do really well uh, in that kind of environment. 
Absolutely. I could only imagine. I, I love that answer. Uh, if you don't mind me um, kind of adding to that uh, a comment or a statement for the, the young gentleman out there, uh, I, I really think that Marquette raises a valuable point in the power of languages. And I think I would like to encourage other young men out there, many of, of any stature, to uh, maybe consider studying foreign languages and uh, continually expanding the language that we speak of ourselves, because I think that two of the most valuable skills in the future, considering our economies direction will be computer science skills or communication skills. Either you're talking to computers or you're talking to people in a very particular way that cannot be, uh, it's indispensable from technological automation. Mm -hmm. So as right. you just said, China becoming such a prevalent force, a preponderant force in our world, and especially even our own country, then maybe some of us picking up some Mandarin here and there and not being too discouraged by seeing like a insuperable task, I think is yeah. not always the worst thing to consider. So my brothers out there, Please, you know, study languages if you Absolutely. can, if you want to really, you know what I'm saying, put yourself in a good position. That's Once a good point. And, and you know what, Jess, I've traveled around to many markets. And for the most part, if you're in the Middle East, you can get by on English. Mm -hmm. If you're in Africa, you can get by on English. Um, some parts of Africa, you, you might need a little bit of French, but moving from English to French is not so difficult. Mm -hmm. um, in Latin America, you can get by on English pretty well. And Spanish, or English and Spanish is not so tough. In China, there are a lot of signs in English, which is nice, but you will have a lot of trouble in China trying to get by on English. So sure, you're right about that. In Korea, you can get by on English because it's so well designed for American audiences. But China, you're going to need that Mandarin. So uh, that is a great piece of advice. And also, kind of adding one last thing on that, too, is that. I think we're so heavily underestimated in America as multilinguists because one, we don't usually put an emphasis on becoming polyglots and you know exceptional foreign speakers, but also two, we do have the disadvantage of being landlocked. We're one of the few major countries that literally are only, we're only exposed to Mexico and Canada. So we are at a disadvantage as far as learning different countries. If you lived in Belgium, oh, you're right next to France, you're right next to Spain, you can go to the Netherlands, like you can learn three languages just off living where you live. So here, you're only exposed to English speakers and most of the time people who do know the, another language will still try and reinforce their English because that's the dominant force here. But if you are once again, one of the rare individuals that picks up even the basics, even the rudimentary lexicon of a foreign language, and you go somewhere else, their expectation is down here. You hit them with a little bit of lingo, yo parlo italiano e poco, see? These cats lose it. They're like, whoa, you're an American that can speak? Oh yeah, no. And it pushes you, you know, it's in a different place in their perception. So once again, my advice to the cats out there is like, yo, like you'd be surprised at what you can pick up if you're intentionally learning something. So there's things called italki, I this thing is two I's, T-A-L-K-I fantastic platform for studying languages. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave it at that, man. I don't want to, you know what I'm saying, uh, continue uh, prolonging my, you know, my, but yeah, thank you once again for, you know, joining hey, me and it's a pleasure it. uh, conversing Young with you. Young K.I., this man looks related to him. You're right, this is Cousin Just, apparently. <laughs> cousin Just, <laughs> I, I, I already know, as I'm saying, bro. I, I rock with you, you have no idea, bro. You got support all over this country, man. Cast, I really rock with you and just, yeah, just want to continue to see you thrive and succeed, man. It's, it's real out here. I, I believe in you. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, I'll see you at the top. Sounds good, man. Peace. Peace. Okay. Um, so, looks like we got uh, Darnell pulling up. Saint, talk to me. Oh, snap. Hey, what's going on, man? China, you're going to need You hear me? That is a great piece of that. And also, kind of adding one last thing on that. I. Yeah, uh, we're talking about the book, book right here, and um, I wanted to share what what stood out to me as far as in the book. Um, okay. And I wanted to, is it okay if I want to read a paragraph? I don't want to give the whole book away. Yeah, absolutely, but man. Go I ahead, read, man. I want to read something that, that really resonates with me, and I want to share it. So I'm going to start this paragraph right here. Uh, it says, Mama, Mama, it's Christmas, I alert. She opens the door. Okay, go get your brother. My mother, brother, and I reassemble in the living room. I really, really, really want a remote control car and a camcorder. I go to the biggest box and shake it. 
Oh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't let that one out, Darnell. You can't let that one out. Oh, that's cool, though. You know, you can't okay. let that one out, Darnell. Okay. You can't let that one out. <laughs> you like, hold on, hold on, stop, stop. You can't let that one out. Look, you can't let that one out. I got you. I got you. But it that one catches people off guard. Saints, I apologize for having to be impolite and cut off no. the saint. But the saint was about to tell a story that's going to catch you off guard if you haven't read the book. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to take that away from you. <laughs> no, we good. We good. <laughs> well, you know, I was like, pick the good one. <laughs> You take the good one. And you know what? That particular story, I didn't even realize. What, and then I was like, oh, okay. And yeah, now I remember what he's talking about. And and that one is kind of like, it was funny because as a kid, I didn't realize things were all bad to the last minute. Right. And, and that one taught me about the people who are your family or your friends and are supposed to be there for you. Sometimes they're not. And yes. sometimes we have to realize that the people we choose to be in our life, you don't choose your mother, you don't choose your father, you don't choose your auntie, but you get to choose your friends. You get to choose the people, the associations you're a part of, the groups you're a part of, and you need to choose that carefully. Make sure that they're solid people. And that was a big lesson for me, but I, I had to stop the saint. You good, you fine. <laughs> I apologize, but, but go ahead, talk to us. But we good. But um, but yeah, that really stood out. And folks, once you get the book, you know, you got a little tidbit, but once you get the book, you know, you'll be able to understand what we what we're talking about. But um that part was uh, phenomenal. And then I remember reading in the earlier chapters, um when you was younger and you was very, you know, you're very gifted, very intelligent, um, academically, you was good. And you did you did a test, and um, you did well on your test. But the teacher uh, didn't think that you was doing things fairly, even mm -hmm. though you was. So right. she was projecting her negative thoughts to you, based on what she thought. But it wasn't the case. And a lot of people will do that. You know, uh, will will project their negative thoughts. Um, you know, like how you experienced when you was younger and um, you know, but you just got to keep going and keep doing you and being successful and doing you. And you're going to have haters out there. That's going to try to uh, again, project um, what they think you should be because they don't see they self there. So that part of the book really uh, resonated with me. And, um, and it seems like that something that forever goes on, even as you get older, it doesn't matter. You could be in your 20s, 30s. You still have people that you're going to um, have to deal with that type of situation. So um, right. that part really resonated also, Marquette. Darnell, you're so right. And the strange thing is that your teacher, especially as a child, you would think the teacher would be building you up. And that teacher was doing the opposite of what a teacher should do. She wasn't teaching me. She was tearing me down. Fortunately, I did not let it get to me. And I shared that story because I know everyone has an experience like that where someone tried to tear them down. Someone in a position of authority, you were a kid, they were an adult, you were an employee, they were a boss. Someone above you who could have helped you tried to tear you down. And I shared that story because I think that, you know, we all have to remember that I can't go outside of myself to get this inspiration. Sometimes I just got to pull it from the inside because the things that are outside are sometimes just real negative. Um, we're going to merge in Dom P with us, Darnell, to join this conversation. Also, we're going to um, address Dom P with us, Darnell, to join this conversation. Dom P, we're in the building, fam. Hey, how you doing, Marquette? I'm feeling well. How are you? Doing pretty good. I just had a quick question. So I know you've, you're like a businessman. I just want to know, out of all the businesses you've been a part of, what is your favorite as far as like product business, service business. Uh, I know there's a lot of different types. What would you say is like the most profitable, the most scalable? What would you say? The most profitable business is technology by far. The most scalable okay. business is technology because you can pretty much instantly deploy it globally uh, with just a different place. 
so that's the most profitable, the most scalable technology by far. Nothing compares to it. But was it the most fun? Not at all. It's really with an intangible. Like you, you talk to your grandma and she's like, oh, yeah, what, what, what do you do? And you're like, I make an app. My app is trapped inside of this phone. You can't hold it. You can't touch it. And you're old. You can't even really understand what it does. So that, that didn't really connect me to people. My favorite business, the most entertaining business, is women's rap shirts because I love the way women look. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to move you guys real quick I'm talking. I love the way women look when they feel confident, they feel sexy. So I would love seeing them in something that I made. Uh, that was really dope. And I got to be around a lot of beautiful models. So I enjoyed that. Um, that was my most fun business. But I didn't claim that for the day because I didn't love it. You can only love a business that you truly understand all aspects of it. Like you've been a consumer and you've also, I think we lost Don P. You've been a consumer and on the producer side. So with women's wrap skirts, I don't wear wrap skirts. So I was never truly passionate about the product. Um, so other businesses that I've enjoyed, um, men's hats, men's velvet slippers, these I love, but they're not the most profitable business. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Jay who Mill Millard writes, what are your thoughts on boxing at 36? What do you think, Darnell? Hey, that's what you want to do. Go for your dreams, go for your goals. There's never, you know, as long as you could um, pick up, you know, hold two hands up and you, you know, go out there and do your thing, man. So, hey, period. Tom Brady's playing on football at 43 years old and he's on top of the league. LeBron James <laughs> is imagining how, you know, you could stay in shape. You know, he's in his 30s, but still operating like he's in his 20s. So this day and age right now, you're at the time right now where, you know, age is... <laughs> It's a, it's a thing of the past. So you go do your thing. Exactly. Exactly. I could not agree more. The only challenge with boxing that I do want to warn you about is people underestimate how high skill of a sport it is. You tend to think, well, everyone can fight, not realizing that the power at which a boxer throws a punch, a trained boxer versus a civilian is so different that if you found a female professional boxer, that weighs 120 pounds, she can throw a harder punch than an untrained male civilian of 200 pounds because the actual form of the punch matters so much. I say that to say, when you go into that boxing gym, do not let them get you in that boxing ring sparring before you're ready. You should take at least five to six months to get in physical shape, to train the tools of a boxer, to really go through the motions before you get in that ring because you can get fucking killed in there. Literally, you don't play boxing, you play basketball, you play golf, you do boxing and you do it hard. So I just want to warn you on that one, but I highly recommend it, as uh, Darnell said. So uh, carrying on, just want to acknowledge some more of the super chats. Um, GT Talks writes, I ordered a copy. I know I won't be disappointed. True story. And GT also wrote in an earlier one that I was trying to find. He wrote in his super in his uh, chat that he was attracted to the channel because we don't hate women here. We actually love women. In fact, we want a plethora of women. We want more women here. So shout out to all the saints who see the value of a good woman, who seek to understand female nature, as Aaron B says, and use that understanding to get along with women, to have influence, and be good leaders of women. Uh, any thoughts, uh, anything to add on that, Darnell? No, nothing to add on that, but I was just thinking when you were talking about, you know, the women, is mm -hmm. that um, I was reading on the Patreon that uh, I guess there's a lot of women that's starting to come on the Patreon to get some um, information and, and hear about what we're talking about. I'm assuming, is that correct, Marquette? That is correct. And I do want to shout out um, Yacy, who's a, a, a gorgeous woman of tremendous integrity, one of the lady saints, and she joined way back. And, you know, I had a consultation with her and we had personal interpersonal conversation. I found that she's a sincere woman and sincerely wants to understand our way of being and live by this way we live. And so that I could respect. And there've been a number of other women joining, but I was noticing that some women were joining 
because they want to learn our strategies for dealing with women so that they can play on the opposite side of the chessboard. And that's not what this is about. I re- I'd much rather refund you whatever you paid on Patreon and let you go on about your business because this is serious here. We're not here playing games. We're here so that men can be in a proper position as leaders and we can arm them with the understanding and the tools to be good leaders. We don't need you trying to study our playbook so you can run opposing plays. Female nature is already running opposing plays. And so to to come in as damn near a double agent to engage in espionage, I said the price is so low that people are like, oh, I'm curious. I I just want to get a a membership just to be, no, I want it to be high enough to where you're serious. Um, so that, that bothered me a lot because I could tell like, it's the kind of woman who wants to behave like a man that would do something like that. You don't need to be in a space that's for men. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to say something real quick to you, um, to you, Marquette. Um, mm-hmm. you was doing a, um, a video a couple of days ago and you was, you know, you was training, and you was answering questions as you was jumping rope and everything like that. And you said something that, you know, you was given the knowledge, but you said something that really resonated with me that I, I wanted to make sure that I said to you um, when I was able to get a chance to um, to chop it up with you. And uh, what I wanted to do is, just hear me out, I wanted to apologize. And the reason why I wanted to apologize is you said that, uh-huh. you know, a lot of times when I, you know, do my videos, I say my name, um, but people mispronounce my name and it's attention to detail. And that hit me because there's been plenty of times where I would openly admit that I would say Marquette, but it's Marquette. Right. So I want to make sure that, you know, that, that I apologize for that because you allow me on your platform and it's Marquette and everything. Mm-hmm. So guys, you know, it's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't make you less of a man to apologize mm-hmm. if you if if you want to do right, that's how you get better. Okay, mm-hmm. so that could be a mini lesson here and everything like that. But I, I know it's more quick, so I want to make sure I get it. You know, I can you know make sure I get it right. And you know <laughs> so what? I appreciate sure. that. I appreciate that on so many levels, and I'm gonna make a note of that because I was, I'm often writing down video ideas because you'll you'll probably notice and give me say because you said something that. Is so important. Right. You'll notice a lot of these YouTubers are trying to make videos about topics that they think are popular or current events, or they're constantly doing the same. Alpha males do this. Beta males do this. They're doing all this stuff because it gets clicks. I make videos that I know for sure are not going to get clicks. I got a video called, um, what's the importance of Mr. Rogers to American society? No one is searching Mr. Rogers, no one. I make videos that I think are core to development as a man, core. And you mentioned something that is so core to being a man, a real man, which is to be able to accept the truth. If you're out of line with it, to make amends, whether it's apologizing or just correcting your action. And that is so hard for human beings to do in general, women in particular. And increasingly, men are having trouble doing that because they're acting feminine. Right. I cannot tell you how many times I've had a, a situation where I was talking to a woman and she was clearly wrong, but she wouldn't back down from being wrong because the emotions make them hold on to their ground so tightly. It's right. a very feminine thing. I, let me give you an example. I kid you not. This is a real story. I was telling a young lady that she was in error. And gentlemen, you don't have to be rude or mean when you point out that someone's doing something wrong. But I told a young lady, I was like, you are in error. You did this, this, and this, and that is not acceptable. And then she says, well, why are you yelling at me? I'm not yelling at you. I'm speaking in my regular tone. I was like, you know, yelling means to raise your voice. I never raise my voice. You are lying. And she says, well, yelling doesn't have to be raising your voice. Yelling can be just being having an angry or aggressive tone. I said, well, first off, I don't have an aggressive tone because I generally speak in the same voice. Secondly, if I did have an aggressive tone, that's also not yelling. Yelling is raising your voice. Give me a second. Let me pull up the definition. 
because we are going to go by the definition of the word. So I pull up the word and I read it to her. I say, yelling is to yell out or raise your voice or do da, da, da. And she says, well, that's not what I mean when I say yell. Well, look here. You don't get to create the definition of words. So she tried to change the definition of the word yell so that she was not a liar. She said I was yelling even though I wasn't. And she tried to change the definition of the word to fit what she was saying. Because she knew that I didn't raise my voice because I never raised my voice. And that was a clear example that most females, meaning 99.9%, when they're dead wrong, they're not going to come clean and say, look, you busted me. I'm dead wrong. Let me apologize. Because it's not their nature to take responsibility. Taking responsibility is some real boss shit. And rarely are women going to step up to the plate in that way and take responsibility and say, you know what? I'm a big, I'm big. And I'm big enough to take this on the shoulder and say, I made a mistake. And I can still stand tall after making a mistake. They feel like they're torn down when they've made a mistake. A real man can come on here like you did and say, I made a mistake. It's nothing. I apologize. Right. It won't happen again. Boom. It's over. Next. But women can't do that. And so I'm so glad you you mentioned that because I was creating a video, uh, uh, designing a video called Lessons Your Father Should Have Taught You. Right. And this is important whether you had your father or not, because some people had their father and their father was a tyrant and taught them the wrong things in life. Some people didn't have their father and they missed out on the lessons. So whether you had your father or not, there's a couple things your father should have taught you. And one major one is that a real man can apologize and correct his ways. I apologize all the time. So thank makes you. you right. and it, it, it makes it just makes you better too. You know, especially if you you know you're apologizing for the you know right. Reason. Like I'm I'm apologizing because I want to be better. <laughs> you know, no, not continue to, do the, to keep doing the wrong thing. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. Let's bring on Marcos. Marcos, if you're there, we just merged you in. To Let's holler at us. Let's see. Is it coming up? Can you hear me? Not yet. You're you're still blacked out. While you're uh, getting that together, we're gonna read this uh, chat. Sound boys writes. Thank you for the great book. Just like the universe, you've provided laws to guide us to a better way of living. I truly appreciate that, and that is my sincere hope. And in the book, you'll see me making tremendous numbers of mistakes. I made almost every mistake you can make. Um, but at the end, I explain, hey, this is the wrong way. This is what I wish I would have done. Or this is what I do now. Or this is what I do in the future. Because we're all human. We are all flawed. But you're right. This book is a new way of living. Marcos, how are you saying? Doing well. How about you, Marquette? I feel great. Thank you for joining us. What's on your mind? How about you, Darnell? Yeah, how about you, Darnell? How's it going? Good to see you, brother. Yeah, great to finally speak with you. I've seen you like another live, but I never got the chance to actually speak with you. So it's a pleasure to speak with you. And of course, always a pleasure to speak with Marquette. And also, shout out to the whole assassin that always, you know, logging in and just saying, oh, shit, my hair looking hella weird. But yeah, anyways, um, you shout out to the entire assassin. And you actually just finished reading the book on Wednesday. Mm. And the story, I know you, you mentioned earlier, you don't want us to spoil any of the stories, but no, the, uh, some, the, of, some of them you can tell, okay. but the one Darnell was about to tell is just was, so juicy. It is, yeah. I know what you're exactly trying to talk about, but of course, <laughs> right. this ain't out here at Fort Knox. <laughs> we ain't saying a word, but anyways, uh, the Berkeley one with the uh, we went to that one, uh, that one, that one club, I don't think it exists anymore out here in Berkeley. But um, it was the Berkeley one with the red dress chick, and yes. then with that with the uh with the uh with the mob from the town. <laughs> yes. That one was crazy. I, I could see why some people wouldn't believe it, but based off right. your content, I believe it. I'm like, yeah, that shit happened for real. I'm like, wow, it's it's crazy, and it sounds like some like something out of like a movie. But based off your own experiences, it's like your life is like a movie, and it's like a lot of like crazy, interesting things that happen over and over again. But on top of that. You wrote an entire book of the stories that are still relatable to most people in any in different ways. So it's it's definitely quite the read and it's very enjoyable. And I read it from like beginning to end, but I do see myself. Um, it's actually on my uh on my Kindle. I got the ebook, but I probably do want to buy the paperback. That way, I just like flip to whatever to whatever story I want to read at the moment. So 
very well written book. And um, it would be great to have it in Spanish as well, since I'm a Spanish speaker as well. I know a lot of people also just speak Spanish. I have like family out in Mexico, and it will be great to be able to share this great, phenomenal book with other Spanish speakers as well. And I know you mentioned you speak Spanish as well. Okay, hablas español también. But I figured because uh, you grew up in LA, well, pretty much everyone in California, regardless of like race or ethnicity, they speak Spanish. So it's either the first, second, or third, or sometimes even fourth language. So, so yeah, it's uh, it would be great to have like additional languages. Marcos, I appreciate that meaningful feedback and. We even have the creed in Spanish. I need to post the creed actually. So we do have the creed of the assassin in Spanish. And to see the book in Spanish, man, it will it will blow my mind, but I got to get the right person to write it in Spanish because a romance language like that is going to be so beautiful. You got to get the person really like is great with the language. So this will happen. Uh, in due time. And I also just love like in Latin America, it's more of a revolutionary culture anyways, right? Mm -hmm. Like just versus the United States. And so I'm very much so interested to see how the Latin American audience will take it. But to your point of some parts of the book read like a movie. And the great thing is I put in real names. There's only like two names that I changed. And I changed those names to protect the guilty, right? Not to protect the innocent, but to protect the guilty. So I changed two names, but every other name is the real person. And I did that because sometimes you're going to read the book like, there's no way. But yeah, for real, that's real. And I put the real name so you can cross check, you can fact check and cross reference everything in there. But the key to the life having been so exciting is that I was always going for that. I was always trying to change and do things differently. I was always trying to be greater than where I came from. I was always trying to achieve more than my father. I was always trying to be something more than what people thought I would be based on the, the trap I was born into. And that's why in the book, I tell you to be the hero of your own story. Every day mm -hmm. you write your life story. If you're not taking risks, your life story will be boring. And so I, you cannot be a hero unless you're doing heroic things. And so I want you guys doing heroic things, setting an example, taking risks. That's what makes the journey interesting. That's what allows you to be able to write a book. And I think everyone should write a book. And I want to read your book. And I remember when I was told by Professor Tate that I should write a book, my first thought was, I haven't done shit. <laughs> first time, I haven't done shit. And, and what I want you guys is to do is think the same thing. I haven't done mm -hmm. shit. And every day challenge yourself, what can I do today that's worth writing about? Mm -hmm. That's where we, that's how we need to be living. Yeah, it's interesting that you learned that you have to be the hero of your story, of your own life at such a young age. Because for me, I feel like I didn't recognize that until I hit like 25, 26, I'm 31 now. So mm -hmm. it's great that you're able to just have so many experiences to be able to share with other people to the point you could write a book. Even though I feel like I could probably write a book from the past five years of my life, because it's also been all over the place. Even though I had like a late start in my life, at the same time, I feel like so much was packed in in such a short period of time that allowed me to just have several experiences that helped me achieve several things in my life. So it's uh, my point is that regardless whether you had like an early start with experiences or later start, there's plenty of, uh, of experiences to be able to share with other people. If you never know which experiences people could actually learn from. Like, for example, is I'm a, I'm a self-employed personal trainer. I've been doing so for almost seven years now. And there's so you face so much rejection. You meet so many types of people like mm -hmm. from all over the world. I live like in Oakland, San Francisco area, and you meet people from all over the world. It's crazy. People speak different languages from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Even though I've only traveled like all over the United States, Canada, and Mexico, I feel like pretty. I'm pretty cultured compared to like other people when I go visit back home in the uh, in the Contra Costa County, which is like in the East Bay, further away from San Francisco and Oakland. And it's crazy because a lot of people aren't aware what really goes on in the world outside of that specific. <laughs> Gary outside of that neighborhood and town. So it's it's crazy how much you learn just by having conversations from people from different parts of the world. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree. Like talking to intelligent people is like reading a book and talking to experienced people, especially people from around the world is like traveling vicariously through them. Let's get to a few of these um, chats and see what you guys have to, to share. 
Mark Newman writes, got your book on order. I'll have to catch up when I get my hands on it. What's up, fellas? <laughs> what up? What up, fellas? What's up, fellas? I like that, Mark. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, Christian Kane writes, your vocabulary is vast. You're constantly using words I've never heard. How would you say you got your vocab to the point where it is now? Number one, I think vocabulary can be overrated, but the vocabulary came from reading. Uh, I read a lot because I've always been a seeker of knowledge because I always felt like I was born into a station much lower than what I knew was inside of me. And I knew that the only way I could get there was through knowledge. And my parents didn't have the knowledge. The people in my hood around me didn't have the knowledge. But when you read someone's book, it's like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person. You can read Napoleon Bonaparte's book without meeting him. You can read Bill Clinton's book. You can read the books of successful men and it's like them talking directly to you. And I've always been a very precise person. And when you use proper diction, which is to say selecting the correct word to describe what you're talking about, you will indeed have a vast vocabulary and it only comes from being exposed to different words. And you'll be more exposed to different words when you hang out around intelligent people and when you read a lot. But I can assure you that the biggest thing in life to move you forward is not what you say, it is what you do. Mm -hmm. Focus on activities. Yeah, on that on that note, um, Marquette, I know it's like as far as like vocabulary, you know, ironically, what I do is like I like Nas. I like like um mm -hmm. sometimes I listen to like a hip hop song, you know, like a Nas or someone like that. And particular words, if I like how it sounds, right, I'll you know, I'll look it up, what does it mean? Or whatever, mm -hmm. and then I use it. It's like, you know, I'll write it down. Oh, I like that word. So as far as like building your vocabulary. You know, just like, again, if I'm listening to some type of music or something like that and I hear particular words or um, I gravitate toward then I'll write in my notepad, I'll, you know, study it, and then I'll use it. And then it's to my disposal. Mm. Mm. Huh. You know what the, and I really want to, I made a video today for Patreon that I did not post because I felt like I was just too turned up in the video. The video, the video was called, Is Ellen DeGeneres More of a Man Than You? And I just went so hard in the video. I was like, I'm not gonna post this. This is too, this is, I went too hard. But oh. I really want the saints to know, and I'm speaking of this in public right now, not among just the assassin. This is a live stream available to everybody. So if you're not on patreon.com slash the saint in the center, uh, this is a privilege. What I'm telling you is some serious shit right now. If you really want something, you will get it. If you really want it, if you breathe it, if you inhale it, if you dream about it, if you think about it, if you speak about it, if you meditate about it, if you obsess over it, you will have it. Mm -hmm. You will find a way. And that's why sometimes I know people are not serious about winning. I'm serious about winning. I can't deal with people who are not serious. And I remember the first time that phraseology was used, I was um, presenting a pitch deck for my business to Sam Drosiegan, the founder of OKCupid, okay the chairman of Match.com. Um, excuse me, I think he's the chair. Yeah, the chairman of Match.com. And they acquired, acquired Tinder. He's like, dude, is super wealthy, very intelligent. And I presented my product to him in a presentation. And he said, Marquette, you're not serious. You're not serious. My, my seven-year-old daughter could do a better presentation to, than that. You're not serious. What he meant was this. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So I had my computer and I was going through my presentation, but I wasn't intense because it was just one-on-one. -on -one. I felt like it was like a conversation. What he meant is, motherfucker, talk to me like I'm an audience. Talk to me like I'm a hundred people sitting here eager to hear about your product. Don't talk to me like I'm one fucking man. Get serious about this shit. Get passionate about what you're doing. I don't give a shit if it's just you and I. You do this shit like you're doing it for TV. That's what he meant. I didn't understand that. I hadn't competed at that high level. This motherfucker made $30 million when he was 25 years old. He's a serious man. So like that changed my mentality 
because now I'm such a serious man. I don't even play games with people. Cat DM me on uh, Instagram. Young man, he DM me on Instagram. He said the following, and I knew he wasn't serious. I'm going to share this with you because I want you guys to be serious. He said, Marquette, I know you're a very busy man. I know you're very busy and you don't have a lot of time. And I know you only really respond to uh, DMs on Patreon, but I'm not one of your patrons. So I was just hoping you would answer my question. And then he writes this long ass message with his question. And I thought, okay, so you're saying you have a question that you really need an answer to. And this, the answer to this question is really important to you. Okay. And you're a stranger to me. I don't know you. I've never met you. I don't know your name. Never seen you on a live. Never did a consultation with you. I'm not familiar with you. You say, Marquette, I know you're very busy, which is true. Okay. I know you only answer questions that are DM to you on Patreon, which is true. So you're telling me that this question is so important to you, but it wasn't worth you to spend $6 to become a patron to send your question is not worth $6 to you, but it's worth me taking out my time. You're not serious. You're not serious about getting an answer to that question. Cause if I had a serious question and it was so serious that I would reach out to a stranger who I know is busy and ask for his time to be donated to me, I'd spend $600, $700, $1,000 on it if it was a serious question. So I said to myself, if you're not spending $8 or whatever it is to get your question answered, like, I can't take you seriously. I got a whole line of people who aren't serious. I want to focus on the line of people who are serious. So that's my tip to you guys is if you want anything in life, get serious. Because the people who can help you, they can tell if you're bullshitting. They can tell. Like a, a boxing trainer, a real boxing trainer, when you call him and tell him like, oh, I can't make it to the gym because, you know, like I got a stomach ache or my eye is swollen. They don't give a fuck about your swollen eye. When I was in my last boxing match, the first round, I got punched in the eye. My eye contact came out. And I was telling this young lady the story. And she said, when you went to the corner, why didn't you ask him to take out your other eye, your other contact? Because when you only have one in, it messes up your depth perception. I said, they don't give a shit about my contact. A cut man's job. If your eye is swollen closed, he cut above it and stick his finger in to squeeze the, the fluid out so that you can see, you can open that eye up. You don't have any sympathy for your bullshit ass contact being out. You're not serious. You come back to the corner and tell them, hey man, my contact is out. Can you take the other one out? Nah, they're trying to give you war plans. They're trying to let you know how to win. Fuck that contact. Fuck everything that you're talking about. I'm going to tell you how to go in there and kill this man. Focus on that. That's what we're talking about. Get serious about what the fuck you're doing. Like, I don't want to hear this shit about like, oh, Marquette, I know you're busy. And I no, fuck that. If you're serious about winning, let's have it in a serious conversation. Like I just talked, I had a consultation earlier today with a young man from Canada who's building a technology company. And he set up a consultation to get my one-on-one -on -one attention. Because he's serious about his business. You heard me? That's why I spent out the time to talk to him. And he sent a follow-up email to Bridget. And he said, hey, I just want to say thank you to Marquette. Because I got a mentor here in Canada. And I'm paying a monthly fee to be a part of this group. And that hour and a half that Marquette spent with me, that shit helped me create my pitch deck for investors. And that shit is way better than anything anybody else has done. Because they never spent the time. They never cared enough to focus. And before Marquette got on the call with me, he went through my whole pitch deck, went through my whole website, researched all our shit, downloaded our app, and went through everything. So when I got on the call, he had a thousand questions for me. We really dug into the details because I knew this man is serious. I would never get on a consultation and not take him serious because I knew he takes himself serious. So I would never disrespect anybody like that. If you're a man, get serious about whatever the fuck you're doing. I don't give a shit if you're a male stripper. I want you to be serious about stripping. I don't give a shit if you're a professional dog walker. I want you to be serious about that shit. When I ask you about that shit, tell me all the details about dog walking. Tell me all the breeds of dogs and how they walk different. Get serious about what the fuck you're doing. And I hate that I have to curse so many goddamn times. But when I get serious, 
This is what it gets like. And I'm tired of dealing with people playing because I don't come on YouTube to be friends. I don't come on YouTube to get famous. I come on YouTube because there's some hungry motherfuckers out there who want to hustle. There's some hungry motherfuckers who want to make a million dollars. They want to get them 10 women. They want to get ambitious goals. And that's who I'm talking to. If you're not serious, I'm not talking to you. Hang this fucking phone up. Hang the call up. Get your ass off the computer. I'm not talking to you. Go watch Netflix. This is the version of Netflix for hustlers. That's who I'm talking to. So I just wanted to share that. Anybody who wants to speak up on that, feel free. Rant over. Ooh, man. man. <laughs> you just went in. But yes, I agree 120%. A lot of people just lollygagging and bullshitting and they talk a lot. They say don't achieve certain goals. They say they have certain ideas. But all of a sudden, as soon as they finish like saying what they want to do, they just start pouring excuses like crazy. Yeah. They start bringing up like they create their own objections. They reject themselves before anything else. It's like before they even create a business plan, before they even pitch it out to other people, before they create the product or service to share it to leads, they reject themselves already. They don't understand that you have to take some L's, some losses, some lessons. Right. In order to grow, in order to achieve certain goals, in order to make a million, two million, five million, thirty million. I'm not there yet, but from what I heard from other people, yes, but I'm planning on getting there. But yeah, it's um a lot of people they just really do like reject themselves before anything. And I feel like if more people experience rejection, facing their fears, and like really truly trusting themselves, like truly, not in the corny ass way, like in a truly, truly deep with diamond cells like they wake up in the morning and they know they're the shit they know they get things done that's when they know they're able to handle rejections handle defeat handle all the challenges and recognize that you know what this is just a little speed bump that's it this ain't gonna hold me back next time next time i see a speed bump i'll drive around it i'll slow down but it won't stop me this time so that's pretty much all i have to say on that point because you already went in on that you went in and just called people out like straight up it's like if you're bullshitting, just get out of here. Go, go with anyone else that is lazy and don't don't, don't want to put in the work. Anyone that wants to put in the work, but like the the, the all the hustlers just come out here and just share our knowledge and we just grow together, rise together. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Let me get that. Let me get that baton from you and then carry on with that. I'll pass. <laughs> the most successful people in the world has mentors and get mentorship, and they invest into mentor and mentorship. You know, you get what you pay for. So, so for that guy that doesn't want to pay for the Patreon, I'm sure you went and got you a six dollar Happy Meal. Uh, no, don't get a Happy Meal this month and pay and and, and get and do things the correct way because it's going to benefit you tenfold. Sometimes you just have to make an investment to get the knowledge that you need to get. That's what millionaires do. Millionaires get invest they pay for more information and it comes back to them tenfold so what marquette is saying is oh he his time is valuable and trust me i did a consultation with him and i am pleased and very happy with my results and mm -hmm. when you get good knowledge that you're going to get then that money that you spent, you won't even care because you feel like you got more than you feel like you feel like you won. You feel like you got the better deal. So people, you know, just anytime you want to be successful, when you want to get to the next level, you know, you're going to have to make an investment. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, period. And, and you know what, Darnell, like the funny thing about it is. I, the only reason I have a price is because people are not respectful. If it was a situation where we lived in a perfect world and I could say only people who are serious about their future ask for a consultation and only those people ask, we don't need a price. The reason we have the price is to separate out the people who are not serious. Cause if it was free, everyone would want a consultation. I'd have, I'd, all I would do all day, every day are consultations. That's all I would do. But I do it to separate out the people who are serious. And what people don't realize is that when you get to a certain point to where you want something so bad and you actually work toward it, you'll get to a point where you got to a limit of your understanding. You did the best you could based on what you know, and then you need to find someone else whose knowledge is here. Then you use what they know, get up here, 
that person might not be any good anymore. Then you got to find another person to get you to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. That's all I'm trying to do is, is make sure that people are hustling and pass them on to the next level. Like, let me give you guys a, a, a meaningful insight. And this is integrity. One young man did a consultation with me. By the end of the consultation, I told him, hey, I'm not going to do any more consultations with you. I will not accept a penny from you. I will not do any more consultations with you because you don't need to talk to me. I know who you need to talk to, though. I know the perfect person for you. I'm going to put you in contact with them and y'all could go from there. Because here's the thing. I don't need your money, bruh. But what I love is that I see you're a hustler and I know the skill set you need and I don't have it, but I know who has it. I'm going to connect you with that guy because that's all I'm here to do is if I can help you, fantastic. I want to be a stepping stone because when you write your book, your version of the black box, I want to be in that motherfucker. I sure do. God damn it. I want to be in it. I want to be in Darnell's book and him say, hey, man, I had these goals and I achieved these goals because of Marquette Devon Burton. He helped me. I want to be in Marcos's book. Hey, I want to be the number one trainer west of the Mississippi. I talked to Marquette Burton. He helped me get there. I didn't do it for anybody because I can't do anything for anybody. I just want to be a stepping stone. You hear me? I want you to step on my shoulders and get, and move forward. That lights me up to be a part of your story. So that's what I'm here for. Uh, shout out to uh, Tajane Nicole, one of the lady saints whom I recognize has been with us a while. And fellas, we are going to, or I should say saints, we are going to expand this movement. I'm thinking about doing a second channel targeted at women. And it has to be a, a separate channel because the shit I say on this channel is for men. You mm -hmm. hear me? Shout out to the lady saints who, who get where we're coming from, who respect the man's leadership. But we also need some content targeted at women who say, hey, I want to follow this way of life. I know that the man is the leader. I want to sign up for following a man. And I'm going to be a great follower, a strong woman who knows how to follow a strong man. So we want to get that going so we can build our nation because you can't have a nation with just men. That will be some MGTOW shit. And we not fucking with that gay shit. Heard me? No disrespect. But if men are going their way and there's no women there, that's the wrong way. I'm not with it. Carrie and all, we're going to pop up some more uh, comments. I'm walling out tonight. You got to you gotta forgive me. You got to forgive me. And by the way, um, my uh, moderators, feel free to, to do what you feel. Yoda writes, right, written word is often more refined. This is true. You can get so much across in writing. Um, Marcos, oh, oh, Marcos, <laughs> Marcos, just finished on Wednesday. Great stories and lessons, especially your stories at Cal Berkeley. OTA writes, how am I being skipped? I think I already may have hit his question, but you guys are not being skipped. I'm just way behind mm -hmm. in uh, popping everything up. Hako Hako writes, very inspiring. Thank you very much. Brian Williams writes, this brother is very well-spoken. He has some great in-depth questions. I think he's referring to my, my twin who had the dreads on. Darnell, did you see Did you see me? You saw my, my other, the other me with hair. That's what I look like, man. Nuck writes, have you ever been to therapy or had the need to go to therapy? Nuck. In the society we're in today, there's a breakdown of all of the institutions that existed in the space that is today filled by therapy. Maybe way back, if you had a challenge, you might go talk to your preacher, your pastor, your imam. Or if you had a situation, you might talk to your father because he was a wise guide. Or, you know, there's someone in the community or your grandparents still lived in the same household. In many places in the old world, the grandparents live across the street or they live in the same household. They have wisdom. You can go to them and express yourself. Today, our families are broken apart or dysfunctional. So we have to go to paid individuals to listen to us and give us advice. It's unfortunate, but sometimes it's necessary. So if you feel you need to go to a therapist, you probably should go. I would never advise against that. But I always advise you to look within yourself. Mm -hmm. And I do have a video called something with the word therapy. Maybe it says Therapy won't help, something like that, which is not true. It's, it's just the title to get you to think, but it gives you four things you can do to make your life circumstances better, to make yourself feel better, to get out of depression, things like that. 
Have you ever been to therapy? Check out the black box. It will answer that question if you read through the whole thing. It, did you guys have any um, notes on it? So uh, personally, I've never been. To, oh, my bad. Don't know. Are you going to speak? Oh, yeah. Hey, I'm going to go yeah, to the green room. I got 1% power. So, oh. um, okay. <laughs> so I'll be on deck if, 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 if I can. I'm going to switch up. I got to switch up devices. So Absolutely. Right. Okay. Right. So I'm going to pull you out. Cool. Talk okay. to me. All right. So personally, I haven't gone to therapy before. I've actually done different methods, like like you said, looking within yourself, speaking mm -hmm. to other people, reading specific books, specifically The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Have you read the book, Mark Quirt, The Power of Now? Bruh, absolutely. <laughs> I highly <laughs> recommend it. Absolutely. Hell yeah. That one helped me out with anxiety, with panic attacks. It was a lifesaver for me. So shout out to Eckhart Tolle for writing that book, and it definitely helped me out too. Actually, um, I know we're on record, but fuck it, I'll say it either way. Actually, like experiment with psychedelics, I don't do them anymore. They actually help out with anxiety and other mental issues like I said back then too. Uh, meditation, but I've never done any therapy sessions, but I did everything else. But I have like several friends and family members that did go to, ter go to therapy and it really helped them out as well. But like Marquette said, is if you find a need to actually do it and you can afford it, or if you have like the uh, financial assistance to do it, yes, go for it, definitely. Yeah, man. I mean, what I want you guys to understand is like, I'm not trying to turn anybody into a robot. <laughs> you know, um, I say be strong, but don't be so strong that you can't ask for help. There is nothing wrong with getting help. That's why we have the Sassin, a community to support one another of like minded individuals. That's why we have the conference. So we can come together in friendship and love and we can speak light to one another. There'll be a moment at the at the conference where we all come together and say, you know, hey, what's the biggest thing on our mind? Like, what are we working toward? And we're just going to each person is going to say what they're working toward. And we're just going to speak light into that person. Tell them like, hey, Marcos, you can do that. You have the skills to do that and encourage and build you up because this world takes you down so much. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. There's nothing wrong with therapy. I want to be the first person to say that. Carrying on. Uh, Adrian Mora writes, love seeing people use that government thing. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, just passing through some of these comments as we start winding down. Uh, official Dreamer. It's called The Black Box. I think someone had asked the, the name of the book. Any tips on managing clerks and giving orders to those your age? <laughs> um <laughs> I think that people always are more inclined to listen to someone that they like. So when you have a good relationship and you have rapport with someone that's going to help, when people know that you're a sincere leader, and sometimes we confuse a leader for being out in front and being a boss. Sometimes a leader is a servant. When you seek to help people do their job better and you seek to be a servant to the people you lead, mm -hmm. then they will have a lot of respect for you. But the truth is a job title will never give you power. People will follow you because you can deliver the goods. Think about it. Who am I? Why, is, why do we have 200 something people on the call right now? I don't have a title to any of you. I'm no one's boss. I'm no one's leader. People follow because they know that I have a sincere interest in you being successful because I struggle so much. People know that if I can help you, I will. That means something to people. So that's to help you get your fellow clerks to follow you, even if they are the same age. But here's the kicker. If you're the leader, you do need to have some superior skill, knowledge, or ability so that people can look up to you because generally people want to look up to their leader. So make sure that you're sharp. Any thoughts on that one, Marcos? Wherever we'll put, especially you got to like deliver the goods because a lot of people, they rather receive first before they're actually willing to, to be led. Like, for example, like, like I said before, I'm a personal trainer. I've helped like over 100 people over the years. And they won't just go up to me because they just see me. And they just say, okay, that's a personal trainer. Because you can find plenty of trainers that are bigger and stronger than me, but they don't have like the leadership. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the, the people skills in order to get the job done. So once um, people recognize that when they first meet me, they say, okay, I want Marcos to work with me. And not just with that, but with like friends and acquaintances with family as well. Because initially I was shy and socially awkward. 
But once I develop the skills, people recognize that, oh, like Marco's got his shit together now, at least compared to beforehand. So now they're willing to listen when I speak a lot more now. They ask me questions and they recognize that they actually get quality answers instead of some bullshit that I just come out from my head. That's right. Agreed. Obard Thwain writes, you motivated me so much, man. I really love you. I stopped watching these so-called coaches because you opened my eyes to more than females. You opened my mind so much more. Love you. Hey, the love is mutual. And Saint, I really want to emphasize that I don't tell you the things you want to hear. I tell you the things you need to hear. Mm -hmm. It will never be as profitable to tell the truth as it is to tell lies. It will never be as profitable to focus on the difficult things rather than the easy things. We're in an era where people would rather get a tummy tuck surgery than to get their ass on a treadmill, right? That's the world we live in. So it's difficult to change your diet, to exercise every day, to, to live a new way, to not eat the foods that taste good so that you can have the body that you want. That's difficult. And people are always talking about red pill. This is not red pill knowledge. This is no pill. Mm -hmm. Because red pill represents a drug. And what drugs do is they take you away from reality. What I try to do is dive your ass deeper into reality. Mm -hmm. Because when you get familiar with the truth, with the real reality, then you can start fixing things. You hear me? Like, I like to deal with what's real. And I like to have people around me who tell me what's real. There have been times that Bridget looked at me and said, you know what? You got to go to the gym. Your arms are starting to get soft. Like, you're not doing what you need to do. You need people around you that'll just tell you what's real. When I was cutting weight for boxing, I was an asshole. Bridget told me, you've been an unpleasant person. You just got to be around people who are going to tell you what's real. Because guess what? If you look in the mirror and you keep lying to yourself, saying you're not fat, you're going to stay fat. You got to look in there and see the reality. So I appreciate that, Obard, because I know that you're a person who cherishes the truth. And I know that I could make more money if I kept lying to people and giving them fake get rich quick schemes and giving them fake get a girl quick schemes. But I don't have none of that. I just got truth, cold hard truth. That's all I got for you. And I do want to point out when you talk about these coaches, look at these. I looked at some of their stuff. There's never a woman in any of their videos. I'm like, how are you a dating coach? I ain't never seen a bitch. You ain't never shown me a bitch. Show me a bitch. I see one bitch. Like, like, how are you a dating coach when you've never gotten any women around you? You don't have any women serving you. Like, how are you a, a, a mastermind of women? This is all fake. And they do these staged videos where their friend is supposedly recording candidly and they go talk to some woman. And next thing you know, they're like arm around the woman or they're kissing the woman. These are actors and actresses, and it, it saddens me that you guys are fooled by this. Not you guys, but saddens me that people are fooled by this. But we're in an era where anyone can get on the, the YouTube or the TV and just talk as though they know something when they know nothing. So I appreciate those of you who have knowledge and can recognize a genuine article from The Imitation. Mm -hmm. um, anyone have any uh, thoughts, questions, comments on that before we go to the next? Yeah, just to pick up on them, um, them pickup coaches, you know, like um, Coach Wayne the Goat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it amazes me because, like you just finished saying, you know, when I do look at, if I look at the video, I'm like, I never see them with a woman. Like, if they're getting all these women, at least let me see one. It's just the fundamentals. Like, let me see a woman. What you're talking about, you claim that you have. So, I'm always kind of suspect with um, with them uh, them dating coaches. Um, you know, they're kind of like Transformers. You know, more than me, God. You know, <laughs> and they, absolutely. You know, but, yeah, I feel what you're saying exactly, 100. Yeah. percent Actually, could I add on, add on to that? Please. So something that really stood out to me that you mentioned on one of your videos, you said that you'd rather win in real life than on the internet. Once I took that to the heart, because in the past, I tried to win on the internet. I tried, but it's hella phony shit all over the internet. I'm like, I don't do that. I can't do that. Even if I tried, I can't do that. A lot of times when I say certain things like on social media, it's like I said before, it's like the truth. 
It's like, stop pointing fingers, take responsibility for your own actions. Stop acting with your emotions, think logically. Instead of just being reactive all the time, stick to your truth at all times. But a lot of times people become too reactive and they say, no, I'd rather they get triggered or offended or they like, they say, yeah, that's right. But they're, with their, um, they'll comment, yeah, that's true, that's facts, but their life doesn't reflect it. Again, that's more bullshit. So I'm like, nah, nah. It's like, I'd rather just win in real life because that's what I'm doing in real life right now. I'm winning with uh, with people, with business. I'm enjoying life. I'm like going out, doing uh, Muay Thai training, running, even out to slow down a little bit today because my knee is hurting, but it feels better because I know how to take care of it. But anyways, my point is I want to win in real life. Fuck winning right. on Instagram, fuck winning on YouTube. Of course, we can use like um, social media and the internet as a tool like we're using right now just to keep in touch with great people. And by the way, my just thank you for just having this platform for me to have this great conversation with you guys and everyone else. But my point is that I'd rather win in real life and use the internet as a tool whenever I have to use it instead of letting the internet use me as a tool and try to get validation from other people. Woo! Woo! Ring the bell! That's game. <laughs> That's gang. I'm glad you brought that up. And Marcos, the, the funny thing is that I can tell the Saints have a much higher IQ than the followings of every other YouTube. We attract high IQ people here because only smart people can understand what the hell we're talking about. That point about winning in real life versus the internet is so meaningful. I had one guy, like often in the comments, people will come onto a video whether it's the coach red or the coach pink pill roast or Corey wine, or it's the, the critique of the four horsemen or any of these things. And they'll say, or, or the Kevin Samuels roast. And they'll say, Hey, you know what? I think that you're jealous of these guys because they have more subscribers than you. And I think you don't know how I'm built. Cause here's the funny thing. You can check my real background. I'm winning in real life, not the internet world, which is mm -hmm. means this. You can see pictures of Marquette Devon Burton with the mayor of Baltimore, two mayors of Baltimore, like they know me personally, the governor of Virginia, the mayor of New York, they know me personally. You see, what that means is if Marquette Devon Burton does something stupid and say I need a pardon, I can get one. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I know people who can get things done. I'd much rather be Marquette Devon Burton than any of these guys because I was wealthy before the internet. Mm. Like before people started doing Patreon and all this other stuff. Like I've been running corporations with offices in Korea, in, like in Puerto Rico, in Chicago, in St. Louis. Uh, and I can just keep naming them. I was getting real money, not internet money, not like mm -hmm. super chat money or uh, however the fuck these guys make money. I didn't write a book to make money off of a book because for people like me, books don't make money. Mm -hmm. Like I kid you not, the money I carry in my money clip, which is my pocket change. Do you know for my book, I kid you not, where's my book? I have not, my pocket change is more money than I've made selling this book. Hmm. This in my pocket is more, I, I've made, this is more than I've made selling this book. I did not write this book to make any money because books don't make money. Software makes money and that's what I do for a living, software. I made this book so that young men, old men, all men can read this and find a source of strength and guidance in themselves. Not to read about me. If you read the foreword, it says this is a book about you. I encourage you at the end of each chapter to ask yourself, how does this apply to me? Too often we get wrapped up in other people. Fuck Marquette Devon Burton. Marquette Devon Burton ain't shit in Marcos' life. He not shit in Darnell's life. Marcos has to make Marcos' life better. Darnell has to make Darnell's life better. This book tells you what I did and then says, look in the mirror. What are you going to do? Do that shit in the real world. You could take a great picture, but when you look at my pictures with the mayor of, uh, or the mayor of Baltimore, mayor of New York, um, governor of Virginia, president, those are not photo ops. It's not like, hey, let's take a picture. It's like we were having an actual conversation and someone recorded a moment. Like if you mention my name, they say, yeah, Mark Webb, Devon Burton. I know him. He's a businessman. Yeah, I know him. 
That's why I'm telling you guys when when these children on the internet confuse a real businessman, like one guy's super, uh, one guy's uh, chat, I didn't put it on the screen um, and I will. He said, before the internet, before you were known, how did you get people to buy your products? Before <laughs> you were known, before you were like the saint in the center. I was Marquette Devon Burton before I was the saint in the center. People know Marquette Devon Burton in the real world. That doesn't show up on social media. Like Mayor Bloomberg of New York, he's a billionaire with a B. A billionaire with a B. When he knows Marquette Devon Burton, by the way, I used to run a program at Johns Hopkins Medical. He came and wrote a multi-million dollar check because of what I said. He knows me personally. What that means is that I could have a thousand followers on Instagram or 10,000 or 30 million. That doesn't convert to money. <laughs> I want you guys to focus on the real shit in life. If I catch a case and I could reach out to Mayor Bloomberg and say, hey, man, I need some political help. He can help me. And all the crazy shit I've said on the Internet won't matter. Because powerful people who are your friends will get the job done. All the crazy shit I said as a same center won't matter because he knows Marquette Devon Burton. And when people said, how did you sell your products and services before you the Satan the center? I've been a CEO before that, like I people respected me because I went to Berkeley and I went to Johns Hopkins and I achieved while I was there. Like I didn't become an Internet sensation. Like I've been like winning before that. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm on here is to tell motherfuckers the key to success because I've already done what I wanted to do. The only thing left for me is to help other people win because guess what? When you get older and mature, you get joy off of other people winning. Mm -hmm. That's maturity. If I was a young man, I'd be competing with you guys. I'd be trying to outperform you guys. I'd be trying to fuck your bitches. I'd be trying to get more hoes than you. I've already done all that. I've been in Dubai having threesomes with French girls. I've done everything I wanted to do. Now I'm trying to tell you how to do that. Now I'm trying to tell you how to get your bag together. I'm trying to tell you to have $3,000 in, in pocket change. Mm. Uh -huh. When I pull up to the fucking valet, they love seeing me. Because I tip the valet more than they make in a fucking day. I know they don't really like me. They just love the fact that I tip. But I tip because I have it to give and I know they need it. Mm. And what I want you guys to be in a position of abundance so that you can give. The only reason to make money as a man is so you can give, give to your loved ones, give to your family, give to your friends, give to yourself because you deserve it. So like this Internet shit is nothing like when I see people on the Internet, like flossing like their diamond earrings or their chains or all this stuff like it's goofy to me. I rather you floss the things you do to serve other people. That shit is goofy to me. And like this internet stuff is whack anyways, because when you look on Instagram, people are pretending. They're showing things that don't reflect their reality. I know a girl who works at Steak and Shake. She got a hella fat booty, little blonde girl, fat booty. Ooh, she finer than a motherfucker. I ain't gonna lie to you. But she works at a fucking fast food restaurant, but you never know it. Looking at her Instagram, looking at her Instagram, you think she's a famous model. That's how phony it is. So as Marco said, when in the real world, let's talk about this real shit. Let's talk about what you really got to do in your real life. You heard me? And the truth is, I lose hell of money doing this. One day I'm going to tell you guys what I've really lost doing this. I never lose my real relationships, though. The people who really fuck with me, the women who really fuck with me, they can hear me say anything crazy on the Internet. And it's not going to bother them because they know who I really am. They know what I've really done for them. There's nothing I could say that would ruin our relationship because I have too many deeds invested, real actions. But investors, have I lost a lot of money? Shit. Yeah, one day I'm going to tell you. One day I'm, have I lost business deals? Yeah, one day I'm going to tell you. But there comes a point in your life where certain things are more important to you. You know, and I know that Talking about the pimping was just a door to bring people in to a real meaningful knowledge. If they didn't hear about the pimping, they would have never came in the door. Huh? Yeah. I realize that it's a master plan. We think in high level shit here, folks. Um, shout out to the lady Saint Cinnamon Madonna who supports the movement. I always want to highlight our women because, again, we don't hate women here. We love women and we want to honor them and honor the men because the women here, they know 
that a real man is supposed to lead. So these are women who are respectable and respectful. Saints, did you have anything you want to add? Well, the beautiful thing of what you're saying is, first of all, you was who you was before you got here. So you're pretty, you know, you're pretty legit. And I know, of course, I do my due diligence. When I first um, got onto the Patreon, I checked you out and looked you up and it was easy, like super easy to find. Yeah, this dude's a, a, a really a businessman. This dude's really doing things. You know, it's not like you have to search and and scratch and all that. So everything just came up. So that's what attracted me to um, to be on here because again, what you were saying, you know, and then the fact that I know you stand by what you mean because you're losing money, like you just stated, even doing some of the things that you're doing, but you're looking at a bigger cause. So you know, us saints, we appreciate it. Just want to you know make sure you you know that that. We're so appreciative of the knowledge you're doing and the sacrifices that you're making, and they are seen and they're not overlooked. So we want to just we appreciate it. I truly appreciate it. And Paul says that I missed his super chat. If you guys would retype Paul's super chat, if he would retype it, just put super chat in all caps and retype it um, so that we can see that. Uh, we're going to start winding down because we always end up going too long on these things. But for me, I really appreciate that I can come on here and fellowship with you gentlemen, because everyone has so much experience and knowledge. And I would never pretend as though I know everything and I can answer all the questions. A wise man would be inclined to listen first. And so every time I hear a question, I always wanna hear you guys speak first, because I know you have knowledge and I'm enhanced by what you say, and then I can add on to that. And that's how we all want to be oriented on being listeners and learners. Um, and we do want to honor Paul. So if someone could retype in Paul's super chat, super chat, Paul donated and said, did you ever go over your time in college, going through community college, then Berkeley, your journey through that? Uh, if you're asking, did I ever go over that time in college, meaning in the black box, in the book? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of explained how I went through community college and then ended up in Berkeley, which is a curious story. I wouldn't go through, I didn't go through the front door, so to speak. Um, and what I really want people to learn from that experience is that a real hustler finds a way in. In high school, my grades were trash. Uh, I mean, real trash. Like if you read my book, you'll read about what the counselor told me about my grades and my prospects for my future. Um, and so I kind of found a way to finesse my way into Berkeley. I left high school early. You'll find out why. And it's not because I was smart. Um, it's the opposite. <laughs> so I write this book to let people know it's not the perfect people who are successful. It's not the smart people. It's the hardworking people, it's the focused people. And we won't measure our success by dollars, no. Mm -hmm. A wise man told me, his name is Dr. Renford Reese, he's a professor at Cal Poly Pomona. He says, do you know what you call a dead millionaire? I said, what is that? He says, you call a dead millionaire nothing because no one cares that you were a millionaire once you were dead. No one remembers people just because they had a bunch of money. You remember a man by what he achieved. You remember Muhammad Ali. We don't know how much money he had. We remember him because he was the greatest. We remember Martin Luther King. We don't know how much money Martin Luther King had. We remember him because of what he achieved. Che Guevara. We don't remember how much money Che had. We remember him because he was a fucking revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X damn near had no money when he died, mm -hmm. but nobody cares. We remember the greatness of the man. And he oriented me on the idea that, nah, this money, that's not, that's not gonna get the job done. That's not the true measure. Happiness, contribution, understanding, that's what gets the job done. I Rather than have a million dollars, I'd rather have a million people be able to say, that man helped me do better. That man helped me earn. That man helped me provide for my family. That man helped me be happy with myself. That's the true measure. So I might talk a lot about money and earning. I don't expect anybody to be a millionaire. I don't care. I want you to be happy, number one. Number two, I want you to be able to provide. And number three, mm -hmm. I want you to be able to produce. Sometimes producing leads to money, but I want you to be able to produce, meaning create 
create products and services, create information, create lectures, create things that other people can feast on. And, you know, just recently I was uh, having a conversation with Bridget and she was like, yeah, I remember when we lived here and we, we produced this and we produced that. And it just dawned on me how many things we've created. Cause there's one of my patrons to ask me, how do you, how do you become attractive? And that's a, and I, I really think about the questions I'm asked and, and I realize that the most attractive man is a producer. Hmm. He produces stuff. And I, and I realize like I'm attracted because I produce some shit and um, not shit, but I produce high quality things, but um, I'm gonna probably do a video about producing. Cause I want to tell about all the things I produce, not to aggrandize myself, but to give an example of when you get your head on straight and when you understand business processes, one man can produce more than 30 men. Because if those 30 men don't understand business, if they don't understand how to produce, how to organize teams, how to get women to help you and work for you and serve you, if they don't understand that, one man can outdo 30 men. And so mm -hmm. I'm trying to arm you guys with this now so you can produce like 30 men rolled into one. Mm. Right. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on Saints? The power of leadership, man. <laughs> like you said before, it's like when well, you mentioned the power, like being more powerful than 30 men is because it's not because just you is because you're able to influence so many people mm -hmm. to be able to just duplicate or even do better than you can alone. So it's just the, your efforts being tenfold, twentyfold, thirtyfold, a hundredfold. And it is mm -hmm. through like leading for example or just finding the right people and putting them in the right place. That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Domo Worldwide Super Chats writing, dating a unicorn, single male or single M? Is that a single mom maybe? Yeah. Dating a unicorn, single mom, she's loving, has a master's degree, is submissive, better than all of his past exes. It's long, it's, he put long term, I don't feel comfortable raising another man's kid. Am I tripping? Mm -hmm. I am $85,000 a year, 29 year old with no kids. Thoughts. Mm -hmm. This is serious right here. Yeah. <laughs> Saints, what do you think? Man. What's Everyone it? has a different definition when it comes to unicorn. So it depends. Because sometimes when people say unicorn, it's a, it's a woman that, you know, is open to doing a threesome. That's from my experience. That's what I've heard. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what you're referring to. So if that's the case, my I'm looking forward to so, yeah. so, um, oh But yes, but um, it depends what he's looking for. Because uh, submissive women, depending on what location you live, I'm in the Bay Area, they're rare. I only have like one. So the rest of them I'm still working on. But, you know, it's great to just have a submissive woman because you're able to just be in the natural form, your natural masculine form. You're able to leave properly. You don't face as much resistance. And everything just flows accordingly. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But it definitely does depend on what he's looking for. If he's looking for just monogamy and open relationship. And again, what's his definition of unicorn? So it really does depend what he's looking for and what exactly he's referring to when it comes to the word unicorn. That's why we put on quotations. Marco, shout out, because uh, a woman willing to do a threesome is a type of unicorn for yeah. sure. Uh, so shout out on that one. Uh, Darnell, talk to us. Okay. Submissive, check. That's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, do you feel comfortable? You got to think, how old is the kid? Is the kid uh, about 15, 16, be at the house in a couple of years? And then, you know, you won't have to raise them as much? Or is the kid three, four years old? Then you know you may have to be more into his life. How's the father's relationship with his kid? Is he a good father? Mm -hmm. Is he, you know, spending time with the kid? Is he a deadbeat? Is he not around? That means the kid's going to be more attached to you because you're going to be the father around. So them are all the questions that you have to ask yourself. So what I would suggest you do is, I know it sounds monogamous, but make a list. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, she's this for me. She makes me happy. She's submissive. That's good. She's attractive. That's good. She may be fit. That's good. Okay, but she has this kid. Okay, um, or whatever things that might bother you, and then just weigh between the two. But what I would say is if, if, if the kid is older, almost out the house, I think you should go for it. Because the kid's gonna, you know, he's already pretty much raised. If he's younger, then that's something that might be a little bit more difficult for you, tied to also 
is the biological father around. So it's a lot. It's a lot to think about. So ultimately, it just depends mm -hmm. on what you what you want your happiness um, to be. Mm -hmm. That's but, a very meaningful piece of advice you give Darnell. And I, I like that you told the saint to go forward. I do want to acknowledge that life is rarely perfect. So every now and then you get things that are imperfect. If she truly is a unicorn, go forward, enjoy. It sounds like you might be suspicious of if she's a unicorn. Um, but I can tell you this, Domo. Number one, if you in your heart of hearts, do not want a single mother. If in your heart of hearts, you're not really feeling this particular kid, then you gotta leave now because you're gonna get out of there later and it's just gonna create more baggage and more anger when you leave in the later stage because you built up rapport with the kid. You know, He kind of felt like you were a stepdad. This is kind of a bit more messy. So better to leave sooner than later if in your heart of hearts, this is not what you really want because our way, we tell you to go for the best, go for what you really want. Now make sure you're realistic, right? We're also reality based. So that's number one, be realistic about what you can get and go for what you really want and can get. So that's number one. Number two, you're saying you're dating a, a unicorn, a single mom. If you're on patreon.com slash the saint in the center, you really want to know what I think about dating a single mother. I have a video called, Should You Date a Single Mother? That's literally what it's called. I highly recommend you check it out. There's some things that can't be said on YouTube because they will take this video down. So check that out. Um, secondly, you, put, you don't feel comfortable raising another man's kid. Well, if the father's still in his life and is still playing his part as a father, you won't be raising his kid. But I can tell you, if you have a woman and the other man is still involved, you will never have dominion over that woman. Mm -hmm. And you should always seek total domination and control, uh, not in a negative way to be controlling, but to have full influence. Mm -hmm. So my short answer is it sounds like you need to set some barriers with her and let her know, hey, love, this is the level we can get to. Is that OK with you? Or you need to just get the fuck out of there. <laughs> right? I mean, that's pretty much all I can tell you, fam. Mm -hmm. um, I think we missed the super chat. Let me get back to it. Um, please rechat any super chat that we have missed. Mr. Highway writes, Miss Super Chat, do your moral slash ethics stem from your religion? How has your relationship with your God impacted your life choices? Can you talk about it in the book. My morals and ethics, it's hard to say if they stem from religion or not, because it would be arrogant for me, having been raised as a Southern Baptist Christian and having been taught that Bible talk from my grandmother since I was a young child, it would probably be arrogant to say that I didn't soak any of it up. That would be ludicrous. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely I was raised as a Christian and I was raised in a strict Southern household. So I'm sure that gave me a foundation. So yes, I think at some level it does stem from that. How has your relationship with your God impacted your life choice? I don't think it impacted it at all. I've made my decisions based on what feels right, moral, and honest in my heart. Not necessarily based on what it says in a book or what the religion says, but based on what I felt is right or wrong. And I think that most of us, especially the saints, if you're not a wicked person, you can feel in your body what is right and what is wrong. Sometimes you do something that is not quite right and you can feel that was the wrong thing. And I've always followed that feeling. Lastly, do you talk about it in the book? In the book, I talk a tremendous amount about morals and right and wrong and doing the right thing. And in the book, I do a lot of the wrong things. And I always come back and explain why it was the wrong thing and what the cost was. There is a cost to everything. If you go to thesassin.com slash about, or you click about from the top menu, it'll tell you the philosophy that we follow. And one of the things it says, you will receive rewards for your good deeds and punishment for your bad deeds in your life. 
If you do bad things before you die, you will be punished for it. If you eat a whole chocolate cake, which is a bad idea, you will be punished by having a disgusting physique. If you work out, which is a good thing, you will be rewarded by having a strong body. Your rewards and punishments will come during this life. Um, thank you for uh, reposting that super chat. Uh, a strong astronaut traveler writes, I'm sinning right now. I'm getting some dome with this chick I met a few days ago while soaking up this game from the homie. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with some good brain. A lot of us haven't had good brain in a long time. We forget what that's like. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Sometimes you just don't have the energy. <laughs> you know, you just lay there and say, girl, do what you do. Uh, legendary Vegan writes, how long have you been with her? And is she okay? And is she okay that you're separate from her child? Meaning that it's okay that he, she is not around you or her all the time. That was in response to the super chat about the eight-year-old kid and the single mom. And Musa writes, what you believe is a unicorn could be a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, Miguel, the comedian, super chats. Thank you for that. He writes, I'm a saint thanks to confidence creator. How do I deal with crazy people? It's hard to stay at peace around negative energy. Saints, what can you speak to Miguel, the comedian? Anytime you have haters, anytime you got negative energy or haters, you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. So just... Uh, Yep. Just realize that every time you have haters, you're doing something right. So it gives you validation that, damn, I'm going to be doing something good for that haters. Mm -hmm. If you don't got no haters, you ain't doing nothing. So if you're, if you're, if you're successful, you're going to have haters. Use them as mm -hmm. confirmation, affirmation. Like, dang, man, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm, I must be good. I got these haters coming out. Now, when you start just hearing crickets, ain't no haters. You need mm -hmm. to set your game up. So... Just realize, you know, it's part of the territory. Um, even in, in the, you know, high school, you know, you would have haters. But guess what? Even when you get older, you think it goes away. You think, oh, people mature. You know, you're not going to have haters. It does. It's it's going to be there. You're always going to have trolls and mm -hmm. haters, no matter your age. So just learn how to ignore them, and and learn how to continue doing what you're doing, and you'll have more haters coming out the rocks, come from under the rocks. So mm -hmm. just, it's going to happen no matter what you do, if you're successful. That's right. Yep. Well said, Darnell. Just to add on into that, um, haters come in all shapes, sizes, disguises, forms <laughs> of communication, and there's so many different ways. So you see them in person, do their facial reactions, facial expressions, even if they're wearing a mask, you can still see it through their, through their, through their eye moving through their eyebrows. So um, I'm just used to like reading people's body language because it's what I do for a living. So, but anyways, um, it's a great skill to develop, be able to catch it. You'll be able to catch it even when it's subtle. But anyways, going back to what you were saying before, how to deal with crazy people. A lot of times just ignore it. They're just uh, uh, your audience. They basically want to see the show. You're the performer. You said you're Miguel the comedian. You're basically putting yourself out there. You're putting in the work. And they're the spectators. They ain't doing shit with their life. They're jealous of what you're doing. You're out there. You're doing your thing, and you're also seeking guidance from uh, Marquette because he's very knowledgeable. He's like, you know what? And we just happen to be here too. We we just get additional uh, feedback. But anyways, it's just ignore them. They're just your audience, and deep inside, they kind of appreciate you in a sense, but they don't know how to express that, so they express that through hate. Humans are weird; they do that. So, but it's 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 a it's a weird form of flattery. That's what I recognize. A lot of times when people hate, it's a really, really, really weird form of flattery. That's pretty much all I have that, to say. That's so true. And if you can, move haters away from you. If you can get them away from you, I absolutely advise to remove that negative energy. In fact, I have such a strong winning mentality that I cannot tolerate any loser thinking. I had a young lady... Um, a, young, a Bangladeshi young lady. And she says, hey, Marquette, good luck on your fight. I hope you win. But if you don't win, I just hope you don't get injured too much. Wait, well, you, well, you said if I don't win, bitch, 
Get the fuck out of here. Man, I must have blocked that bitch so quick. I blocked her dumb ass so quick because here's the thing. I don't box to lose. I don't do anything to lose. Mm -hmm. I do it all for the win. I only understand the win. We can only talk about winning. So when she said, if you don't win, everything she said out after that is out. I blocked her. Why? She has a loser mentality. And I'm not going to waste my time explaining to her that that's not what a woman's for. A woman is to encourage. A woman is here to say, well, you chose to box. I'm not going to tell you not to do it because you've already decided to go into this pursuit. Now that you're in it, I'm going to support you the best I can. I'm going to help you get ready. I'm going to help you train. I'm going to help you win. I'm not going to doubt that you're going to win. So I got that bitch out the way quick, man. I don't want a friend like that. I don't want a family member like that. I don't want a spouse like that. Winning is all I want to hear. It's all I want to see. So if you have negative energy and you can move it away, move it away. Get them the fuck out of there. There's no need to waste time around negative people if you can escape it because that energy will tear you down. But I tell you this, if you can't get them out the way, the best thing you can do with a hater is do it like you're doing it for TV. The best thing you can do with a hater is to win. Hey, man, I love pulling up on a hater looking clean. You hear me? I love when a hater sees me and my car is freshly washed. I love when a hater sees me and I'm with a bad bitch. I love it. So the best thing you could do is if a hater wants to watch Marquette TV, I'm going to make Marquette TV look great. There are some people who subscribe to me. I kid you not, just to hate on me. Sometimes I post up a new video, and before I've started the live session, someone's already clicked a thumbs down, which indicates that they subscribe just to hate. It's amazing. I would never do that because I ain't got that kind of spare time, and I can't think of one person on the planet Earth that I don't like. I can't think of one person. That's my mentality versus their mentality. Yeah. Even though people hate on you, you don't need to hate them back. Feel sorry for them, but don't engage them because it's a waste of your time. You heard me? Unless you can strategically use them to achieve your aims. Like in my last live session, the hater who will remain nameless, but he hopped on and I had to roast him because in roasting him, it gave me an opportunity to share my perspective. So I, I got to share the wrong perspective. And then I got to line it up next to the correct perspective. So he helped make a teachable moment. I leveraged him. And I got to create entertainment for all of you. So anytime you can do that, fantastic. And the black box chapter 15 is called frenemies. Mm. Frenemies. They pretend to be your friend, but they're really enemies. Chapter 15 is called frenemies. There's three chapters in here where I talk about specifically about your friends betraying you. I give a whole story on your friends, friends that you were close with betraying you and how you need to deal with the situation. So I highly recommend you pick this book up because those are the kind of things that unfortunately, as Arnell said, you're gonna experience that when you're young, when you're middle-aged, when you're old, until the day you die. It's been said that you should love your enemies and hate your friends. Love your enemy. Excuse me, yeah, love your enemies because your enemies never change. Mm. They'll always be your enemies, but your friends do change. Mm. Mm. That you love your enemies because they're consistent. You know they don't like you. Wow. Love your enemies because you know they're trying to fuck you over. <laughs> love the fact that you understand their position. Your friends, you got to be suspicious of because they might act nice today and betray you tomorrow. Mm. Right. In this book, I tell a story of a young man that I started hustling with. We literally sold drugs together. You would think when you're taking penitentiary chances with someone, where you're risking your freedom with someone, you would think you'd be close. You would think you'd be real friends. And it tells how this person betrayed me in this book. Mm. And... It tells you what I did in response to that betrayal. This book also tells you that there are three categories you should put someone into. This is your friends, your women, your family, three categories. No association, meaning you're cutting them off. Limited association, meaning you're minimizing 
your interaction with them. You're not cutting them off. You're staying cordial, but you're not really into them like that. You're limiting it. You're being thoughtful about the time and energy you give that person. And expanded association. These are people you admire, people you can learn from, people you want to grow to be like. That's expanded association. So here's the key to those three categories. When you put someone in no association, meaning you're cutting them off, make sure that you were thoughtful about doing it. Once you burn that bridge, you ain't going to look over the ashes. Once it's burned, it's burned. So before you burn that bridge down, have a conversation with the person. Give them a little bit of time. You know, we realize that we are flawed just like everyone else is. So show kindness. I'll give you an example. I have a good friend of mine who even helped me in times of challenge. I'm not going to say his name. He might even be uh, watching this live. He came out with a book a long time ago, and I just met him. I I was just being introduced to him, and he had came out with a book. And the the person who introduced me had said, oh, yeah, you know, this is so-and-so. He wrote this book. And I said, oh, you wrote a book? Where is it? I want to buy it. I bought it straight away. I didn't know him. I didn't know him from Adam. I didn't know what the book was about, but I bought the book straight away because that's the kind of person I am. If I see you producing and it's something that I can support, I, I want to support it. Now, there's some things like if it was a T-shirt and it was an ugly T-shirt, I might not have bought it. But it was a book I figured might be interesting. So I gave him a chance. I just bought the book straight away. When I came out with my book, he didn't buy it. And I was thinking, man, that's, that's really uh, that's strange because we've known each other for years now. I bought your book and I hadn't even known you for a day. I just bought it because I'm a solid individual to right. show you love. But I've known you for years and my book has been out. And you haven't bought my book? Like that made me feel a kind of way. I don't know if he's bought it now. He said that he did buy it. And I take him at his word because he's generally an honest man. When I initially, like it was a, a month or so went by and he hadn't bought my book, I just it didn't like what do I care about? Like the $20 or so that he would pay. Because it costs like $10 to print the book anyways, right? Like, what do I care about the $10 profit I would make? I more so cared about like, damn, bro, like you don't have love for the homie. Like you don't have love for the homie who I love for you. From the second I laid eyes on you, I show love to you. Like you're my brother, my blood brother. That hurt me. And I was thinking like, man, maybe I should cut this guy off. Is this guy jealous of me? And it turns out maybe he's not jealous. He says he did buy the book. Maybe he did. There's no way for me to track because if you buy my book on Amazon, I can't see who buys it. Amazon does not tell me who buys the book. So I don't know. I didn't cut him off because there was more to our relationship than just the book. Sometimes things hurt your feelings as a man and you have to just eat it and realize there's a bigger, our relationship is bigger than this one problem, this one little challenge. It hurt me. But our relationship is bigger than that. So I didn't cut him off. And he's st- I still consider him a very good friend. So I want to share that so you don't put people into no association unnecessarily. You put someone in the limited association when you're not sure about them. They're a little shaky. You're not trying to be who they are. You don't admire them. Limited association. Expanded association is when you're trying to be like the person. You're trying to learn from them. You're trying to enjoy life with them. That is when you invest to be around those people. Like the the conference that we're putting on, I'm excited to go because the people who are going to be there, I know that those are the kind of people who are in my tribe. You know what I'm saying? Like these are men of accomplishment. These are men who take responsibility. These are men who respect physical fitness. These are men who love women. These are men who want to be better leaders. Like I'm excited to be around these kind of guys. I've taken saints out to lunch. I've taken them out to dinner and I pay for the lunch. I pay for the dinner because I'm investing into learning about them. I'm investing into building rapport with them. Expanded association. You have to make an investment. So expanding association, you're investing your time, your emotion, your capital, whatever it is to be around this good energy, to be around this inspiration. So when you see someone who has what you want, find a way to be around them. You see someone who gives you joy, find a way to be around them. Um, that's really, you you really want to focus most of your time on expanded association. Ask myself, who do I know that I really admire? There's this one woman I know she's a, um, very successful woman. Um, and I was thinking like, man, like she is dope. Like I really want to be around her more because she's killing it in business. I want to learn some of her secret sauce. You heard me? So she puts on a gala every year. It's hell of expensive. 
I get that money together to go because I want to be there. I want to be around all these people who can afford it. I want to be around her. I want to soak up that energy. I want to soak up that knowledge. So I put the money together, even though it hurts every time. It feels much better when I get there. It feels much better to know that I invested in myself. So expanded association is something I always pay attention to. Like when Angela um, you know, comes into town, I want to spend time because she's an intelligent, accomplished person. She's done things I've never done. She's been in the Olympics. I've never been in the Olympics. I want to know what that's like. I might never get to go, but she can tell me about it or she might tell me about it and then I might get inspired and actually work for it. So that's what you really want to focus on is that expanded association. So just to, to your point, put your family members and friends in one of those three categories, but don't focus on the jealous people. You can't change them. Focus on the expanded association. Focus on that bright side where your energy flow is shown where your focus goes, energy flows. That's what you want to do. Focus your energy on the positive side. <laughs> Don't win, Scold the Boy Voice. Absolutely. I was appalled. Talk about some losing. And shout out to Aaron. He says that six haters dislike. Don't you love it? I love it too. That they really took their time to click that thumbs down. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, how do you dislike get the videos not even started right? They dislike it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um yeah, we get we got that one. Chris also writes, this was from Big Mike Real TV. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Thank you. I appreciate you rechatting that. Chris Kozart writes, Mr. O says, hey, Saint, my older brother is an alcoholic. Mm. My family has tried everything to help him, but we have failed. Please help. Saint, do you have any words for, Chris, or for Mr. O? I'm gonna leave that one for you, Mark Quex. Yeah, okay. I'm not an expert at this, so. Got you. Yeah. And I don't know if Chris Kozar is super chatting other people's, like super chatting their stuff that they super chat, or he's just super chatting their questions, which he thinks are really important. I don't know, but I have this sense that Chris Kozar has a very saintly heart and is helping put these questions up. So I appreciate you, Chris. And I just wanna say again that the saints are always about showing love, man. Like. People are always saying, oh, don't brag. Don't talk about your accomplishments. Don't... Hey, I want to hear about your accomplishments. <laughs> Shit. If you win in, tell me. I want to celebrate you, God damn it. I want to tell you you're the man. I want to hear you talk your shit. I want to see you swagging in this motherfucker. You heard me? Uh, so Chris Kozart, thank you for uh, resharing this. Writes, hey, saying my older brother is an alcoholic. My family has tried everything to help him, but we failed. Please help well, Mr. Oh, I want to tell you my heart goes out to you because if you've read The Black Box, this book starts talking about some of the trauma and tribulation that addiction has caused in my family. So I know addiction very well. I've never engaged in substance abuse personally, and I always speak against substance abuse. That's why we say hashtag no pill. But mm. One thing you all probably instinctively know, when someone wants to get off of drugs, heroin, crack, cocaine, alcohol, coffee, whatever it is, the first person that has to decide to do it is them. Your mother can want all kinds of great things for you. Your father and your brother can want great things for you. But if you don't want it for yourself, it will not happen. So when you say that, your family has tried everything. I believe it. I believe you guys have to love. I believe you tried everything. But if it's not in his heart to get over that, he won't get over that. So my encouragement to you would be this. Ask yourself how you can continue pouring love on him in a way that's respectful of you and him, meaning that mm -hmm. don't destroy yourself trying to save him. Mm -hmm. I don't preach self-sacrifice meaning you got to kill yourself to save somebody else. No, I preach sharing out of your abundance, meaning that if you can help him, you have some extra energy, some extra time, do that. But if he's not willing to help himself, well, you just got to love him from a distance. 
because sometimes you might get wrapped into someone else's negativity or wrapped into someone else's downward spiral, downward spiral, and it takes you down. They're addicted to alcohol. Next thing you know, you're depressed and you end up in therapy. Time you, next thing you know, you're sad and you can't perform at work and you're losing your job. Don't be torn down by other people's failures because your life is also challenging. So I, I'm not saying abandon your family. I'm not saying that. I'm saying sometimes you got to love people from a distance, okay? If you guys have tried everything and everything is a lot of stuff, if your family's tried everything, the best you can do at this stage is love them from a distance, all right? That's my sincere recommendation to you, and that's love. That's the best you can do. And I, I, I hope all the saints make a prayer. If you pray, if you send energy, whatever you do, send a prayer to Mr. O, send a prayer to his family that they would be well and they'll be strong in this time of challenge. Send light to, to his brother that his brother feels strong and rejuvenated, that he can stand on his own without the, the intoxicants helping him feel better, that he can really feel better. So everyone send a blessing to him, you know, and everyone, uh, you know, send some love his way because he's going through a struggle right now. I appreciate you sharing that with the assassin. Iman writes, there's a Miss Super Chat. How do you become a great public speaker? As I advance in my career, I'm understanding the importance of being a great speaker and communicator. You know what? Please forgive me because I did see this one. And by the time I wanted to click on it, the, the chat had went down. I also want to acknowledge Mr. O. And I'm trying to find that original Super Chat. Um, and I'm missing it. So I'm going to just go ahead and pop this one back up. And we're going to go back. Check the super chat. But anyways, um, Iman writes, how do you become a great public speaker? Well, number one, speaking interpersonally the way you would speak as a public speaker will help. So you'll notice there's not a ton of difference in the way I talk to you one on one versus when I'm on a stage. Practice makes perfect if you practice the right way. So first, perfect your practice and then practice a lot. So I try my best to enunciate when I'm speaking interpersonally. I try my best to have the full experience that I would have when I'm behind a podium. Secondly, practice. The more you can do public speaking, the better you get at it. Number three, great models. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Um, Bell Castro is an excellent public speaker. Adolf Hitler is a great public speaker. I'm not saying I agree with the message. I'm saying the harmony of voice and gesture is unparalleled. That's why it was so powerful. So observe great public speaker. Barbara Jordan was a great female public speaker. When you can observe these folks, they will give you some great indications of how you can find your own flavor and be an excellent and dynamic public speaker. And he's saying, as I advance in my career, I'm understanding the importance of being a great speaker and communicator. Now, communicator is an even more important piece Communicating is through email, through text message, through a personal conversation. Make sure that you're hitting all of those points because you're going to influence people by staying connected. You need rapport. It's relationships that get you a promotion. It's relationships that close a deal. So being a great speaker is not as good as being a great doer. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to hit these last super chats and we're going to get out of here because I was supposed to be off of this call two hours ago and I have some other plans I have to tend to. So um, I'm going to try to find these last super chats. Please forgive me if I missed them. If I haven't said your, uh, addressed your super chat, retype it now, right now, because we are winding down, saints. So we got that one. We got that one. Swiffer Wet Jet. Thank you for the continued support, Swiffer Wet Jet. Was always here uh, sharing the super chat. Swiffer Wet Jet writes, I've been talking to a young college woman for about four months now. Congratulations. Lately, she made bad moves mm -hmm. and you're suffering from them. She's been negative a lot. Should I stick around or walk away? Remember, sometimes as a man, you are the woman's therapist. She goes to you because you are the rock. If you observe a difference in her behavior, you have failed to Dr. Phil her if you don't know why she's behaving differently. So if you understood her character to be one thing and she's behaving in a different way, something is bothering her. It might not be you. could be your family. could be her work circumstances. could be your finances. 
could be all variety of things. So it's your responsibility to find out what that is. And based on what that problem is, you can ask yourself, well, do I want to deal with this or do I want to scram? Mm -hmm. um, another ritual that we use in the Sassin, if you go to the Sassin.com slash about, I think it is, you click about from the menu. Um, one of the rituals we do before we have a meal is we ask the other person, what's one thing you're thankful for? Mm -hmm. Gives an opportunity for us to reflect on the things we're thankful for regularly because gratitude is a great attitude that makes you happier. But also, if you ask a woman, what is one thing you're thankful for, and she's having challenge, she's going to have trouble identifying that one thing. And that's a great opportunity for you to say, oh, is something bothering you? Like, what's bothering you? And so we ask that every time we have a meal. And so if you're dining with your lady and you've been with her for four months, you should ask her that every time you break bread. And if she's hesitant, because when we're emotional, when we're stressed, when we're in a dark place, it's hard to see the light from a dark place. So when you say, what's one thing you're thankful for? She's going to be like, nothing right now, because you said she's been negative a lot, right? So when she shares that negative comment, when you say, what's one thing you're thankful for? Then you say, okay, well, tell me about that. Like, what's what's getting you down? Like, I, I, I know you to be a very positive lady, like what's bothering you right now? And then listen, and then you can help her find a solution or you can just be a great listener. Sometimes you don't have to give an answer. Sometimes mm -hmm. you don't have to solve the problem. Sometimes you just got to listen, especially with women. Anything to add to that, Saints? Uh, you hit the nail on the head with that one. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I agree with what, with what you're saying, you know, listen and Absolutely. We got two ears and one mouth for a reason. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Just hitting these last super chats. Mr. O, thank you for that super chat. Mm -hmm. And Darnell Marcos, I truly appreciate you gentlemen being here to share your game and knowledge and experience with the Assassin. Um, I think we got the one Imam shared. Thank you as well. It's actually been fun really fun doing this and actually get to speak with both of you and answering questions and just learning as well. It's almost like a, like a learning cycle. It's like we share what we learned from our experiences and then we also learn other things we didn't know as well. And also getting different perspectives from the same question. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And thank you, all of you. Thank you. You're, you're so right. And even better than that, you get to reaffirm. If we say something you already knew, just because you knew it doesn't mean you do it. Right. Just because you knew it doesn't mean you do it. And so sometimes we need to hear what's right again and again so we can actually do it. Mm -hmm. Even me, every day I'm trying to re entrench my winner mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, William Thomas writes If you can fight any boxer, who would it be? <laughs> William, I love winning the boxing match more mm -hmm. than engaging in the boxing match, I must mm -hmm. admit. I love the glory after you win. So the glory will be greatest when you defeat the boxer that everyone thought was unable to be defeated. So I would love to fight Floyd Mayweather in his prime and win. Mm. That would be the greatest. Um, so that would be like when he's 50 and 0, fight him then and, and take away his undefeated record and bring all of his glory to me. That would be the most fun thing to do. But shout out to Floyd. Um, that's no, no disrespect to Floyd. That's just me as a competitor. If you're in a competitive sport, you want the glory. So that's what I would do. Uh, thank you for your, your question, William. And folks, I think we have addressed all of the super chats. Saints, we're going to end this the right way, the way we always end this within the Sassin with our creed. Wherever you are, repeat this in full conviction, knowing that this is true of you. The creed of the Sassin. I am going to be who I truly am because I am remarkable. I'm going to be I'm who I truly, be am. truly am because I am remarkable. And I'm going to strive every moment to show the greatest part of who I am. I'm going to strive going to every moment every to show the greatest part of who I am. Of who I am. It looks like one person threw in a super chat and we <laughs> always want to show love to those who show love to us, right? So uh, to honor this individual, uh, I'm going to read out their super chat and we're just going to go just a touch longer. Uh, super Nifty writes, do you have any advice for a 30-year-old in-shape woman seeking a high-value man? 
Let me go ahead and write my Instagram in here for you to DM your boy. <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> Let me go ahead. Uh, that's step one, baby. That's step one. So super nifty uh, Susie one writes, do you have any advice for a 30-year-old in shape woman seeking a high value man? So number one, I appreciate that you put in shape. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Because she's keeping it real because we do know that we, in our mind, when she said 30 years old, we might have been like, oh, shit, right? But uh -huh. she's a shape woman. So, Susie, I, number one, we appreciate all the lady saints anytime you, you join us. And before I speak up on it, I, I want to yield the floor to the saints. Okay, well, a couple of things. You know, 30 year old in shape woman, you're already in shape, so that's good. You're fit. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Smile when you're walking, just smile. When you're walking, mm -hmm. have a friendly demeanor. You know, when you talk, you know, try to have a, a nice feminine tone. You know, you're a woman. Men are attracted to beautiful, you know, women. So mm -hmm. be the best woman that you can be. Um, you know, so as far as your tonality and your voice when you're talking to a man, you know, that's a that attracts men. Um, mm -hmm. uh, submissiveness. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean dictatorship. You know, <laughs> so let's get that. Let's get that. Um, um, you know, right. Uh, learn how to, um, you know, submissiveness. That's that's a good thing. So I said submiss submissiveness. Your uh, your body language, as far as your femininity. Um, you know, just you're already in shape, and be friendly and smile. Men are simple creatures. Trust me. That's you know. So that's what I have for you. <laughs> yep. Darnell. So, uh, yes, like you said before, being feminine, being submissive. And uh, out here in Oakland, there's plenty of women in their 30s are in shape and look great. They look young in their 30. And of yeah. course, you know, you got to get at them. So, of course, um, being feminine, because a lot of times out here, they hold a lot of tension on their face or they're still like they're so career driven or so like educated driven that they just have that mindset at all times. So when they, when they do around men, even if they're interested in them, they still emit that energy and it's not attractive to us at all. So in order to seek a high value man, just be very feminine, but still show, show your own value, but it should be subtle. It shouldn't be like intense. You're not trying to compete with the man. You're trying to be compatible with the man. So just recognize that. Just being, um, being feminine, basically. That's basically what you have to do. <laughs> Good advice. And let, let's analyze this sentence that she shared. Do you have any advice? Yes, I do have advice for a 30 year old in shape woman. So when you said your age is 30. So uh, Susie, my my sincere recommendation first off is uh, I like that you identified your, your stage in life. So if you're 30, realistically, the men who are going to take you most serious are going to be the men who are your age or older. Obviously, I imagine if you're in shape, you don't want to go too old. So I would say realistically, you're probably going to be looking at men who are age 30 to about 36, 37. That might be your preference. Um, depending on your values and your maturity and the man, you could go from men who are age 30 up to 50, depends on the man, right? But I just want to point that out because sometimes women will be 30 and they're dating guys who are 25 or 27 or 28. And realistically, guys in that age demographic are not going to take you seriously as a long-term mate because they're looking for a younger woman. So generally you want to look for guys who are your age or a little older because they're going to take you seriously. They're in that stage in life where they want things that you want in terms of maybe settling down for a long-term relationship. So that's number one on the age side of things. You said in shape. So I would assume by merit of you pointing that out, you want a man that it's comparable in shape. So I would say don't compromise on that part. If you're seeking a high value male. You have to put yourself in the lion's den. You have to put yourself around high value men. And the question for you will be in your locality, where are those places? Obviously, like for example, me, like I take my car to get a hand wash because I can't drive my car through um, a, uh, like those automatic washes. Mm -hmm. So when I go and get a hand wash in Summerlin, it's a very wealthy area. And when you're in the waiting area, all there are, are like trophy wives and ballers. It's just baller mm -hmm. dudes and trophy wives. That's all that's there. So it's just filled with high value men and gorgeous women. Those are the kind of places you want to position yourself. I'm not saying money is the only 
like example of being a high value man, but generally speaking, it'll give you an easier way to discover uh, this demographic of men. So hand car, uh, hand washes, you know, being in places where things are expensive, uh, being at conferences, uh, being at, you know, elite universities, um, going to co uh, concerts for music that you like, as long as it's refined music, going to the ballet, going to activities where high earners are there. And also, you really want to be thoughtful about what you define as high value. This term gets thrown around a lot. I really want to inspire you to get a man who has real values. There are a lot of men who are high earners. They got a bad attitude. They're abusive. They're negative. They will put you down. Nothing's good enough for them. They look at you as just another thing that they can buy and use. They don't prioritize you in the appropriate way. So look at a man who's driven by principles, values, and morals. And also get your ass on the good foot because, love, you're 30 years old. Your ass ain't got all day, so I'm glad you asked me this question. So you need to make yourself available and also don't waste your time, love, because uh, she posed another super chat. I appreciate that. She writes, I've been dating a 35-year-old CEO for a month. We've only gone on one date because he's raising money for a startup. We talk every day. Any advice? Number one, if he's 35, he's older than me. But for sure, if he's 35, he comes from the era of in-person. So it's strange that you've only been in person one time within the span of a month. I don't think that's a good bond. He talks to you every day. That's good. But me, I talk to a lot of people every day. In fact, I got to talk to the, the my Chinese uh, project manager who, who produces my boxing shoe. I talk to her all every day for the last week because she's working for me. As a CEO, we can manage volume. We can talk to a lot of people every day. That doesn't mean we're invested. So I want you to make sure that this man is invested in you. He's actually interested in you. You're not just a side bitch and you don't even know it. Nothing wrong with being a side bitch if that's what you want to be. But if you really want this man to invest in you, you're going to need that FaceTime in person. Make sure that he is really interested and make sure that you're offering value. Figure out what he really wants in life and make it clear what you want. And if you're misaligned, get out of there. Because women will often have a man who doesn't want what they want and they think they can change him. You can't change him. You got to find the man who is already on the road to what you want and you need to join on to that bandwagon. That's what you're really looking for. So to summarize those tips, number one, the appropriate age for this guy is 30 plus. Number two, make sure you put yourself in the places that a high value, high earning male will be. Easy places, a car, uh, a hand wash for expensive cars um, or universities or conferences or trade shows or places where people buy expensive things or resorts or golfing uh, country clubs, things like that. Put yourself in the way of these men. Um, number three piece of advice is make sure that you're seeing him in person so that you can actually build rapport, and real connection. Piece of advice number four is make sure that you know he's on the road that you want to be on because the man is going to be the leader. If he's not going where you want to go, find a man who is going where you want to go. Uh, Susie, do keep in touch. I'd love to hear from you. That's why I share my Instagram. I do have a sincere interest in helping women. I will be probably at some point uh, creating that second channel, and I'd love to uh, hear your input and hear about your success. We love the Lady Saints. I see that some of the Saints have already um, – <laughs> Susie trying to poke me. <laughs> uh, some of the Saints have already um, you know, encouraged you in your pursuit. Um, I wanted to post one up, but I can't find it now. But they, they said, go, Susie. And they, they want you to be successful. I want you to be successful as well. And thank you for, for sharing your question with us, Susie. Um, can you respond? Yes. OK, well, you did just hear me respond. Um, so there you go. Um, wait, that's messed up. OK, Susie, now I got to chastise you, baby, because you put the same in the center. Wow. Ignore my super chat. That's messed up. Wow. And then someone wrote, he isn't ignoring your super chat. Yo, dear, relax. This show is more than just about you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and Miguel puts Marquette does not ignore questions. This is correct. So Susie, you do need to talk to me, okay? You, you definitely need to reach out to me. Um, 
Look, you're already being neurotic, and I don't say that to to disrespect you, Susie. This is very common among women. Your emotions run away with you too quickly. When you encounter a high value man, high value men have low tolerance, which is you'll often hear me talking about cutting off women. Why do I do it so quickly? Because I have so many women. Because here's the thing. Most women are looking for a guy like me. So I can choose. I can pick. If they got a bad attitude, I tell them to go. If they if they have a complaint, I tell them to go. If they're lying, I tell them to go. Why? Because for every one that goes, there's three coming every day. Three coming. So, Susie, I, I just want to encourage you, if you really want a high value, man, number one, you need to be patient. Number two, you need to get those emotions in control because if you've been a, a subscriber of my channel, you know, I don't I don't ignore Super Chats. I go out of my way to acknowledge Super Chats. I go out of my way to answer your questions. So the fact that you would so quickly go negative, that's not very saintly. That's not our way. Our way is of patience. Our way is to be understanding. Our way is to show kindness and love. So I really want you to follow that way. And you might need to really talk to me to get tuned up so you are worthy of a high value man. Because based on you flipping so quickly, I question if you're worthy. You can get in his face, but will he want to keep you? And right now I'm questioning that. Let me see what uh, what the saints have said. He isn't ignoring your super chat. Um. He doesn't ignore questions. Um, he's answering you, which is correct. He's still responding to your first one. Wait, have some patience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so, so soon you see how, how the saints are reacting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to help you get back centered. And this is all love. This is all love, okay? I just want to see if Susie, uh, see, uh, Chris says he'll get to it, which is correct. And, and I did. All of this has come to pass. And let's see if Susie followed back up with an apology. And by the way, someone was kind enough to, to retype in Susie's super chat. And by the way, I've raised a lot of money for various companies. And yes, it's busy, but everyone makes time for that which is a priority susie so if you're a priority he will make the time to see you you don't want to pressure him but definitely he'll make the time if you're a priority so definitely keep an ear out for for that susie writes i'm very feminine and sweet well you weren't sweet when you're flipping out on your boy susie sounds like you need me to spank that ass that's what it really sounds like uh, 35 CEO can date women super young. You're damn right. He could date an 18 year old. I've had 18 year olds. Shit, I've had 16 year olds come at me. 16. I even had a chick in Missouri literally send me a URL to a website that says 16 is the legal age of consent in Missouri. Had to block her. Had to. I was like, shit. I'm from California. I don't give a shit what they say in Missouri. In California is 18. <laughs> um, you ween writes too bad high value men want younger hotter better ooh you throwing shots uh you miss Susie super chat andrew thank you for sharing that uh susie writes i live in san francisco i'm a software engineer very good and susie i used to live in san francisco as well um i lived in pacific heights which i'm sure you know where that is also before i knew any better i, I moved to outer sunset then i moved to um uh, where the hell did I live after out of sunset? I can't even remember. But then eventually I moved to Pacific Heights when I figured out the city. Um, it's a nice place to be. Man, I tell you, if you live in San Francisco, it's a killing field. I never, whew, I never had such a good time than in San Francisco. I can't lie to you. Uh, let's see if Susie <laughs> ever found out to apologize. She writes, he's raising money for a Series A. Very good. It seems like he has a successful company because the Series A is a very significant round. That's a good thing. Susie writes, I appreciate your advice. Mm. She writes, thank you. But I'm looking for that apology. I don't see it. Okay, there we go. Susie writes, I'm so sorry. Uh, Susie, I appreciate your apology. And Butte Wayne writes, time to be saintly. Absolutely. Uh, I'm so sorry. Susie, I truly appreciate your apology because just as Darnell said earlier, it takes so much maturity to apologize and we're all wrong sometimes, right? So thank you for that. I've been wrong before. We've all been wrong before. So again, we do appreciate you being here. Do keep in touch. We love the Lady Saints. And hey, this is good night to everyone. Thank you all for being here. Peace, Saints.